Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We'll start in just a couple of minutes. And while we're waiting, we're going to launch a, a quick poll just to get a better sense of who else joining us this morning and afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Krishna Odai Kumar. It's my pleasure to be the Executive Director of Innovations in Healthcare and the Director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center. And it's great to have so many of you joining us from all around the world today. So thanks for joining this session on achieving value through innovation and uh, especially focused on primary care. So uh, I'm gonna get us started today. And if we can go to the next slide, um, what we're going to see is really start by hearing from you. And as you registered, so many of you were able to tell us uh, what you thought about how best we can support 
the, the sustainable scaling of primary care innovation all around the world. And this is a word cloud that's been developed from all of your responses so you can see what really stands out, the, uh, the focus on access, the work of community health workers, the community aspects, and, uh, and so much more that you see depicted here. Uh, so these are a great way to get us started today and will serve as the basis for a lot of our conversation as we go forward. And one reminder for uh, this next uh, in our series is we'll have uh, the next series in August and hope everyone is able to join us for that as well. That's gonna focus on enabling uh, digital health and data science innovation for new models of care globally. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, I wanna uh, operate with some ground rules today. Please uh, use the chat function. We're doing this as a, as a large meeting on Zoom so that everybody can see who else has joined and can uh, have a, a substantive level of engagement. So you're not just passively listening. So please do engage all along the way. If you have any challenges uh, from a technical perspective, please use the chat for that as well. Uh, and there's our hashtag IIH impact. Uh, so please do share what you learned through uh, your own networks and social media challenges today. With that, we're going to uh, close the poll in just a minute that we started with today, and I'll ask uh, my colleagues to put up the results of what we've seen so far, so we get a sense of who's joined us, where around the world, as well as um, the, the roles that people see themselves playing in the context of primary care around the world. As we do that, I'll also um, let you know that we're going to have uh, some digital hosts that are going to um, share time with us today. So we've got uh, Lisa Bourget from Innovations in Healthcare, as well as Kevin Fletcher and Megan Malouk from Dynamic. Uh, and together they're going to help us curate and, and keep the conversation going on chat over the course of this session. Uh, I wanna now move us to, uh, to welcoming um, Jeff Dill, uh, this session that we're doing today is jointly done between Innovations in Healthcare, the Duke Global Health Innovation Center, and our partner, Vynamic. Uh, and Jeff, as the CEO of Vynamic and his team across Vynamic, have been fantastic strategic partners for us over several years now. And they've done everything from support our own organizational growth and team culture to supporting directly many of the network of innovators that are operating in almost 100 countries globally. Uh, and together, we look forward to even stronger collaborations going forward. So Jeff, it's a great pleasure to have you join us today. And let me ask you uh, for some opening remarks. Yeah, thanks, Krishna. And hello, everyone. Um, so as Krishna mentioned, I'm Jeff Dill. I'm the CEO of Dynamic. And on behalf of Dynamic, I just want to thank you all for joining this really exciting forum. Um, for those of you that don't know, Dynamic is a healthcare industry management consulting company. We're headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So we had a big North American contingent here this morning and, and this afternoon, this evening so far. We also have offices in the healthcare hubs of Boston, Massachusetts, Durham, North Carolina, and London. And, uh, and one of our core differentiator statements that we use at Dynamic is that we're all healthcare all the time. And that statement really embodies our focus around helping clients across all the interwoven sectors of the industry, from providers to life sciences companies, health plans or payers, um, healthcare technology, and as well as public health. And we're all working in the ever-changing landscape of healthcare with so much opportunity for improvement and greater collaboration as well. And now speaking of collaboration, as Krishna mentioned, uh, Dynamic is extremely fortunate and proud to have such a special relationship with innovations in healthcare. Uh, in addition to what's uh, become a really great friendship, you know, we have a structured partnership that's added so much to Dynamic, um, and our consultants get a chance to help support, mentor, and guide several of the over 100 global innovators that innovations in healthcare sponsors. And in return, our team learns and gains new experiences with, with exciting and innovative companies and new ways of working as well as again, being primarily North American based in, in London, um, we get a chance to, to see how healthcare is delivered in countries like Pakistan and India and Kenya and Mexico. And, and that's so important because we believe healthcare is, is really a universal language and there are teams of people solving problems all over the world. And we really need to share these solutions more, more broadly and globally. So today's dialogue around primary care 
it means a lot to, to Binamic for several reasons. And one reason it connects uh, it directly with our core values of learning and thriving. So I'm, I'm looking forward specifically to both learning a lot and thriving through this entire conversation. From a client perspective, the more information we can accumulate around providing smart, effective, and accessible services to patients and communities, the better we will all be. And you know, primary care is, is the foundational element of care that it truly reverberates, right? And as an entry point for health, literally affects everything from birth to death. So if we continue to improve the primary care journey, we improve our lives and the lives of everyone. So again, we are really excited to be part of this great forum series um, and looking forward to some amazing speakers, presenters and discussion today and, and hopefully some lively Zoom chat as well. So uh, Krishna, thanks again, and I'll hand it back over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jack, Jeff. Um, it's my now great pleasure to welcome, to uh, give us our keynote to get us started, Dr. Shannon Phillips, who's the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Community-Based Care uh, and President of the Intermountain Medical Group at Intermountain Healthcare, which is the largest integrated healthcare delivery system in the Intermountain West. And as the physician leader for a group practice of more than 2,600 employed physicians and advanced practice providers, she partners with operations and nursing leaders to advance consumerism, value, health, and affordability. Uh, we are really excited to, to hear from Dr. Phillips about how they think about primary care and the role of primary care and in innovation as a way to advance health and value. Uh, we can't think of a better person to kick us off today. So um, let me hand over the baton to Dr. Phillips. Krishna, good morning, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and thanks. Uh, it, we'll put up the slides. Uh, here in Utah, I'm in Salt Lake City. It is, the sun is just coming up. And so whatever time it is for you, I'm, I'm thrilled you've taken the time to be part of, of um, today's forum. It's uh, probably no more important is um, primary care. Uh, so I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to be with you all. In primary care, we accept the responsibility to be a trusted health partner in care and caring for an individual in their health journey. And um, that role uh, traditionally maybe has been served in offices with doctors and advanced practice providers. And I think we know more now and we know that it's actually a bit of a village and um, that doctors uh, need so many other partners to be successful. And maybe said another way, um, primary care is wide open for innovation and our traditional settings of how we've done this for decades maybe now um, is under attack. And I mean that in all the best ways. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, if we maybe start with the end in mind, I think um, that's helpful to me and our teams. So um, often we say, uh, I'd ask you to reflect and, and say, if we did this really well, if we did primary care really well, perhaps we'd see care and caring for humans better than we've known before. It, health would be better, the cost would be affordable, and we would find joy in our work. And no more important maybe is that last part now as we've come through COVID and seen really the resilience of healthcare organizations and our providers and teams um, across the globe. Uh, the best and biggest ideas come from people with kind of a world changing mindset. We can do this, we can make it affordable, we can bring down cost and we can improve health. And um, we certainly at Intermountain are deeply committed to that. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Intermountain Health System, Intermountain Healthcare is an integrated delivery system. And that term may be United States or North America centric, but I, I just wanted to share a little bit about what that is. We um, actually think that being an integrated delivery system is, is kind of a secret sauce. You have the opportunity to provide care across the continuum from um, maybe a traditional hospital and surgical setting all the way back into the home. And, and in fact, we want to move care as much as we can um, into the least restrictive and most affordable environments. And um, the, the innovation that's needed 
has never been more important really than right now. And so these pieces, digital enablement, being a payer as well as a provider are really, um, really critical pieces we think to doing this. Happily, or for some maybe unhappily, there are innovators and disruptors coming into our healthcare industry and are saying, you know, you guys have not changed enough in the previous decades to make a difference and to really support people the way they need. And I think um, really innovative integrated, del integrated delivery systems are going to leverage partnerships outside of our industry, tech, and other things to really bring to bear the opportunity for a, an individual to care for their own health uh, in the best way possible. If you want to advance this slide. Being an integrated delivery system allows us to innovate. And so I love that this is about innovation today. Uh, we have, in leveraging digital health, in leveraging people at home and things like remote patient monitoring, have been able to bring down cost, put people in the setting that actually allows them to heal most effectively. And that has resulted in um, savings and affordability that we're able to turn back around as a not-for-profit organization and as a payer, as a piece of our system, to patients and communities in the form of reducing premiums. So you see some of the things here that we leverage really every day to give our best care. Um, and I can't stress enough um, that this does not happen if we only function as the system that we are, the health system that we are, we will fail miserably at this. So partnerships with industries and many probably of people like yourselves on, on today's uh, call are really critical um, for us to move as fast as we'd like to and most effectively. Next slide, please. So if you, if, and this really underpins our strategic kind of approach. If, um, if I said to you, what, what matters most in our mountain and advancing value and the health of our communities, it probably looks maybe like what other people are thinking about, right? Excellent outcomes in health, a great experience. And I think that piece has been undervalued um, a lot in healthcare and I think is coming to the fore. Accessible, affordable, and removing health disparities as much as we possibly can. And we think if we can do this well and we have a secret sauce, we wanna, we wanna be present for as many communities as we can to help them live their health, healthiest lives possible. If you'd advance, please. The, um, I wanna dig in on something that is seemingly simple, but is um, I think we, we reflect back on often and I, I imagine across the globe, this probably um, is similar. Uh, so we spend so much time in the sector of medical care and it in fact represents the least, probably some of the least important pieces of health um, and, and primary care uh, that exist. And so we, not that we don't need to do that extraordinarily well, but we have an explosion of opportunity to bring genetics um, and personalized healthcare through um, understanding uh, the genetic code and, and can leverage that better than ever before. And of course, most importantly, are the social determinants of health and the behaviors and habits that we all have every day in our lives that impact um, our health. And what is our social network, the community in which we live and how can health be increasingly um, considered as, as the space beyond healthcare. So that's a really dissonant um, concept for, for healthcare, but really important one, I think. Next, I wanted to touch on social determinants just a little deeper. And I saw in the chat at the beginning, a couple Utah um, people on, the, on uh, the program today, we have an Alliance for the Determinants of Health here in Utah which is the opportunity, again, as an integrated delivery system and Intermountain as a payer uh, partner and a provider partnering with community-based organizations, public organizations to, to help those most vulnerable in, um, in our communities. And it really has 
um, I think the secret sauce of it has really been bringing everyone together. So sort of an awareness that there are issues and gaps and that we could do this better together. Strong screening and then a great digital network that connects all the organizations that could support and serve patients um, together to provide warm handoffs or an alignment that says, here's a gap, can you please help? And then a close the loop when, when that has been taken care of. And in these communities, if you'll go to the next slide, we are seeing some of the traditional um, things that we look for in healthcare as, it, as this has started um, bending. So people are interested in signing up for the digital platform. It's given as part of uh, this demonstration project. People are using the warm handoff tool, the digital tool um, to identify screen needs and identify opportunities to provide care um, connections. And we're seeing that people's health is managed closer to home, maybe with a community health worker with the non-traditional setting of medicine um, resulting in better health and things such as a reduction in avoidable emergency room visits. So there, there is an opportunity for our industry to extend ourselves as strong partners to community organizations and meeting our patients who we um, care for in their home, in their space, in a way that is most impactful to their health. If you'd advance the slide, please. So again, I've probably said this a few times, but a big, uh, a big piece of primary care should be focused on how do we create the most affordable, least restrictive way to serve you? And so often that is not gonna be driving into our office to see us. Um, healthcare, you know, being a doctor, I can say this, um, we, we've had medicine on our own terms for us. It's been very provider centric, we're open when we are, we're located where we are, and you come in and we do things and the price is what it is. And that's not what people are expecting today in the world. They, they have transparency, they have some, you know, when, where, and how they want it. And if we're asking people to, to be accountable for their health, it's so important that we, we meet them more and more on their terms. If you'd go to the next slide, please. Digital matters. So I know we have a number of industry uh, folks and tech folks on the phone. Uh, the call, I um, critically important. This has been a real, um, a real game changer for us to have a platform where uh, people can sort of manage their health, uh, pay for, find care, manage their care needs in one spot, uh, we're finding is very helpful, of course, to patients and, and really, I think, is um, foundational now. It's not going to be acceptable to not be able to connect in such a way if you'd advance. And we're seeing some people said, well, in the digital world, um, maybe we're going to create disparities that um, didn't exist before, that it'll be haves and have nots. And I'm, I'm really pleased to share that we actually are seeing that seniors do like tech and use it. Um, COVID certainly advanced people's comfort with that that we are very attentive to language and um, abilities for others who might have um, disparities simply because of inability to communicate or needing to be communicated with differently, that we're able to reach people in new ways. And we have in Utah, a lot of rural area and so critical access and people living at great distances from what would be traditional care it's really been important for us to connect both their primary care home um, in that way. And when people need specialty care using telehealth to deliver um, is really a backbone of how we're helping people live their healthiest lives, if you'd advance. And then just briefly to touch on population health. So primary care um, serves everyone, right? Serves with it, regardless of insurance ability to pay and was set up, I think if you look back even not so long ago, fee for service, right? We see you, we bill, we see you, we bill. And that model wasn't incentivizing great health. And so population health and the opportunity 
to be accountable for the total person and the total health and cost of care is um, really joyful. We today probably have at Intermountain about 50% of our revenue comes from um, prepaid risk for, a po for populations. And Castell is our, our arm uh, that, that drives the success there. And I think what's been really exciting about population health is to think about um, the power of data and analytics to point us to the right things that patients need and kind of what we call care traffic control where um, once we understand your needs, putting into place um, the right care at the right place at the right time. Um, very attentive again to home-based, both primary care and a house calls format and even bringing specialty care um, again to that least restrictive environment. If you'd advance, please. So I'm completely excited about the intensity of innovation and disruption in healthcare. I may not be, other people may not share that. Um, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. We're very comfortable in our traditional ways in primary care. Our models of caring for people as health systems are, are pretty traditional. And I'm grateful for people pushing us. And so let's not be scared of, of that innovation. If you'd advance, please. If, if we think about um, primary care going forward, I, um, a couple things I think I'd reflect on. One is we need financing models to help us um, do the right thing, right? So moving as much as we can away from um, transactional interactions to ones that have a, hold us accountable for the health of a patient matters enormously. And we're very, at Intermountain, very aggressively looking for those opportunities to be able to care for the whole person. And primary care is the absolute epicenter of that. Partnerships and technology are critical for primary care to thrive going forward. Um, we want to tee up the next best action um, or care need to both the provider setting, the payer setting, and to patients, right? We want patients enabled to care for themselves. Uh, we wanna nudge consumers in their health um, and, and there's a mass of information to sift through. So we really need tech partners in that. We're really committed and passionate about a full on assault in consumerism and that we need to treat people um, yes, as patients, and part of caring for them is to be as accessible and seamless as other industries. So we need to learn there. Uh, we need to have an eye to who's left behind when we bring on new technologies and things, who might be disadvantaged in that. And, and that's something we're constantly asking ourselves. And um, we need to keep the humanism in healthcare and uh, tech and all these cool things and maybe a drone dropping you know, a remote monitoring device to you to watch your health. It's a wonderful thing. And, you know, the sky's the limit there. Let's make sure it stays affordable. Let's make sure it's pointed at the right things. And um, I am very excited about the future of primary care because we can create a better health for um, those we serve in uh, the globe. So thanks, Krishna. I'll turn it back to you. And um, I have not paid attention to the chat. Maybe someone will help me with that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation and hit on everything from the policy and financing to how to integrate tools to really keeping our, our patients and consumers at the, at the middle. So uh, what a fantastic foundation you've laid for the rest of this conversation. Thank you. Uh, certainly, we've had a, a several questions come in. One I might start with is um, you did talk about partnerships as a key aspect. And, and of course, we've got innovators from all around the world that are trying to understand how to best work with health systems, with integrated health systems, especially uh, if you have any advice to give on how from that integrated health system view, how do you think about partnerships, whether it's from a technology or a service delivery organization and uh, and how do you make those decisions about when to partner, when to build out, and what those partnerships might look like? Yeah, um, wow, go straight to the hard stuff, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated. I would say we're not alone, Intermountain, in um, having started this journey as a, we'll build it ourselves, we've got this. And I think what um, 
health systems are learning and please give us patience because I think it, the, the spectrum is very broad is um, that that's not our core business, right? And so I think one of the angles to take with health systems and our industry is our core business is caring for people, right? Is, is helping their health and it's not maintaining you know, digital systems that, um, you know, are going to help us do that better. So I think that is a way to appeal and what is, um, is really uh, important. I think um, being easy to put on a digital platform that an organization has already established, maybe you would be the platform. I, I won't throw that, you know, that's entirely possible, but, you know, I think what's going to happen is we're going to, any organization is going to have a platform and what we're going to need is, um, is people to be able to plug into that pretty seamlessly. And as the industry changes, we're going to have to develop some nimbleness to say, yes, we do want a potpourri. We're used to having one and done and we can control the security. And I think we're all getting comfortable with that and recognize that, um, we are still an industry that has taken some time. So um, I'd say it, we don't, we shouldn't build it anymore, help people realize that and, and be easy enough to use that, that you fit onto the platforms that uh, we, we put in place. So how's that for a couple ideas? That's great, thank you. And I think uh, lots to build from there. Uh, maybe uh, we have lots more questions. Unfortunately for time, I'll give you one last question here. And we've had uh, the similar question come in from uh, folks joining us both in India and Kenya, which is, how do you think about extending primary care out of facilities, out to the home, especially when you think about serving um, rural communities right. or, uh, or in low resource environments? Yeah, it's really, um, that is uh, the hardest part. I think some of our largest disparities um, certainly around the globe and, and U.S. is no different are in those communities that are hardest to reach. I think um, if I had my dream, because this is an innovation discussion, Krishna, so I'll go straight to when, is we've learned, I think in COVID in particular, and our organization has used Tela for a long time, but um, that people, a much, a great deal of the care that we give can be done um, virtually. And so if we could provide a network that allow people to plug in with very simple tools, that is actually one of the, um, I think that's a game changer in rural health. So it certainly is in the United States, we, we've got, we're getting a lot of practice with it in our catchment area and um, so much can be done. You know, if somebody's really remote, you know, I put the drone picture on there kind of as a, tongue in cheek, but not really, right? We've seen companies that have saved lives and reduced maternal mortality around the world by bringing blood to locations. So it's possible. So I think about leveraging tech light to, um, to see people and recognize that health is, is a person's responsibility and we're here to be their partner and coach. And um, I guess I'd think about it that way is not, we always have to see you, but how do we be your health coach and partner and um, see if we can't enable digital and, and tech solutions that way. Thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, just extend my uh, warmest thanks again for joining us today. Fantastic perspective. Uh, thanks for giving us such a thoughtful overview of, of how integrated health can really look like and what the future of primary care can be in, in helping to drive the future of health and healthcare. So thanks again. And please, uh, if you can stay for a few minutes, I'm sure there's much more engagement on the, the chat. Absolutely. To, to I'll look at the chat. Well. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah. So thank you thanks. again. Um, with thank that, you. it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Dr. Patricia Odero. Patricia serves as our Regional Director for Africa is based in Nairobi, Kenya, and really for the last uh, six plus years now has been a core member of our senior team that has helped to design the vision and now implement a whole portfolio of programs uh, aimed at bringing innovation together supporting systems change across the African continent and engaging with the rest of the world. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Patricia, who's going to introduce uh, the next session that'll be coming up. 
thank you, Krishna. And um, yeah, without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Phillips. Um, that was a wonderful way to, um, you know, frame this session. And so we'll have um, two spotlights from innovators within our network. Uh, we'll start off with um, uh, Javier Lozano. Javier leads uh, Clinicas de la Zucca, and um, he'll let us know a bit more about the work that they're doing in primary care. Hello everyone, and uh, I'm very happy to, to be here. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. And if we can have the slide. So my name is, uh, is Javier Lozano, I'm co-founder and CEO of Clinicas del Azúcar. In Clinicas del Azúcar, we provide affordable, specialized and convenience uh, diabetes care in Mexico. If we can go to the next slides, please. So we know that diabetes is a catastrophe I mean, it uh, is definitely increasing uh, across the world. Uh, there are more than 463 million people diagnosed with diabetes. And, and especially we can see there are certain regions like in Latin America and uh, Africa, Middle East, that is, is, really, is really increasing and it is becoming a really burden in, in most of the healthcare systems. And, and I want to point out uh, uh, when COVID-19 hit in Mexico, 72% of people that die from COVID uh, had diabetes and hypertension. But I want to mention the, the, uh, the difference between the mortality rates for people that have the, their diabetes well-managed, the mortality was 1.8%. So basically just like uh, any other group, but uh, if uh, it was uncontrolled, it was 11%. So there was, a, there was a huge increase on that. If we can go to the next slide. And, uh, and definitely in Mexico, uh, it's, it's also uh, very difficult to manage and unfortunately low income people are hit the hardest. Most people have two options, either government clinics or very expensive uh, private care. And, and as we can see, well, one, one four adults have diabetes and 50% share also with hypertension. And it's the first cause of death, first cause of blindness first cause of kidney failure, first cause of amputation. So really uh, it put a, a lot of struggle in around the patients. Next, please. So what's uh, Clinicas de la Azúcar? So we start in, in 2010 and it's a very revolutionary model for diabetes care, just as, as we uh, just listened from Dr. Phillips. So we start as uh, ironically, when we start, we say the, that uh, we were the McDonald's for diabetes care. So we want a place where it was uh, very easy to walk in. We are next to supermarkets and it's a one-stop shop. And uh, it's, it's almost like, it's like an assembly line. People come to the clinic and start, uh, they spend 10 minutes per station. They can see the doctor, a nutritionist, a psychologist, a lab test, a pharmacy, a retail store. So basically in, in one hour and a half, the patient gets equal to six consultations and it reduces 60% of the cost and about 80% of the time. Uh, also, we were uh, the first ones to propose a subscription model for diabetes care. The patient pays $300 a year and they have, it's a, like a club, they have unlimited services. And the last one, we use a lot of uh, AI and, and behavioral science to personalize the patient journey. Uh, something that we believe is that one of the mistakes in diabetes care is that we we think that all the patients are equal. So we have the same guidelines and, and the same recommendations. So we capture electronically more than 3000 variables per patient. So we are able to, to tailor and personalize from their income levels, where they live, if they are married, single. And um, so there are many uh, demographics and, 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 and from the uh, medical outcomes that we can personalize the, the patient journey. Right now we have 21 clinics in, in seven states of the country. And also the patient can, uh, once they have the subscription, they can get their consultations physically at uh, any of the clinics or by phone or uh, video. Next, uh, please. So what's the, uh, the in impact so far? So we have uh, 171,000 patients treated in, uh, in these uh, nine years. Uh, more than 200,000 complications prevented. So I, was, uh, I, I think that's the uh, most important success, the 
trying to manage diabetes. And this is equal to uh, in savings of 450 million US dollars. That means that uh, if, uh, we have saved that for patients, the government systems or the private system, the health insurance. And also we conducted uh, a two uh, year randomized control trial led by Professor John Gruber from MIT and with outstanding results. And we measured the health outcomes and the health, how we can reduce the health outcomes and the health expenditures. So we got uh, an average A1C reduction of 1.8%, basically setting 0.9% above all the other alternatives that the patients have in the area. So basically positioning clinicas de la Azúcar uh, among the, the best in class and, but very, uh, only a fraction of the cost. The, the $300 that we charge is equal to a thousand in the, just by getting typical private care in, in Mexico. And, and next, please. And, and what's next? Uh, we're scaling rapidly, basically right now opening two clinics a month and, uh, and getting in, in the next two years to uh, 30 cities in the country uh, with the objective to reach 500,000 patients by 2023. And also uh, next uh, month, we, we do a lot of care remotely, but uh, we do not have a hundred percent virtually membership and we're going to launch that. Uh, we've been working on the last months to get the one-stop shop experience in the app and, and, and through the web. So next, next month, we're gonna be launching now the, uh, the Clinic as a Super virtual clinic next. Uh, and, and just uh, what, why it's so important uh, in, uh, sometimes we think that diabetes is, uh, it's not as, a, as an urgency, it's not important to act now, but uh, just uh, I, I want to stress how important it is. I mean, we don't see uh, when, when people with diabetes come to primary care, we don't see it as, uh, as, a, as, as an urgency as we see in, in other diseases, but just like uh, we have this example of uh, Victor and Victor was diagnosed with diabetes at age 43. He starts his treatment, but uh, eventually he realized it's so expensive that uh, he did not continue his treatment. So 15 years later, and after several complications, uh, he had an amputation. So that made him uh, lose his job. His wife and two daughters had to start working to sustain the uh, family and, and the very expensive medical bills of Victor. And Victor became very depressed and he already tried to commit uh, suicide twice. And when I was speaking with uh, his wife, uh, it, it was uh, sad that she was saying that, I mean, they, they, the only thing they wish is that he could be dead. It's, it's, he said, it's, it's so depressed, it's so expensive that for my daughters and myself, it's really uh, a struggle to, to take care of him. So this is just, when we talk about the millions of people with diabetes, I mean, there are millions of stories like, like Victor that are trying to manage cost, access, uh, convenience. So it's, it's really important and, 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 and definitely primary care. How to specialize primary care is in, in use of technologies is definitely the key for patients like Victor. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Javier. Thank you, um, you know, just for sharing the incredible work you're doing and especially just reminding us what a difference it makes for an individual patient. And so I want to uh, move on to our second spotlight, uh, which is one of our, another innovator, um, NeuroHealth, um, that works in a different part of the world. Um, so welcome, welcome Shahed and yeah, take it away. Sorry, it just took me a second to unmute. Uh, thank you, Patricia. And, and that was a, a really heartening story uh, and, and to, to learn more about your work, Javier. Um, so I'll be sharing about uh, our work at Nora Health. Um, I'm calling in today from, from Bangalore in India. And I think really over the last few months, um, the world was witness to the horrifying devastation taking place in India. Um, and every day we really do see how COVID-19 has pushed healthcare workers and health facilities well beyond their limits. Um, of course, we've also seen how this has cha challenged families in, in unspeakable ways. Um, the truth is that what's been happening over the last few months in India is not a new problem. Our healthcare systems are often overwhelmed and struggling to manage. 
Um, and as we know, it turns out a lot of the suffering and deaths that occur for patients are preventable. In India alone, an estimated 70% of deaths in children under five can actually be avoided through better health practices. And many of these health practices are ones that can be performed at home. So we at Nora Health really just listened to the people that we served and recognized that there was a compassionate, willing, capable, but untapped resource with a powerful potential to learn and practice life-saving skills sitting right next to the patient, the family member. And we have seen that by training these families, it's possible to save lives. So if you can advance to that next slide, please. Um, at Nora, while the, train, uh, the, the goal of, of training families uh, and uh, of patients is simple, the model is comprehensive. Um, so what you see here is essentially the steps that we follow. First, we create engaging content that incorporates local imagery and, and values. Um, we then train healthcare providers to deliver this content effectively. Uh, essentially, we train them on how to be better communicators because we really do believe that healthcare workers are not just technicians, they're also educators. Um, these trainings happen uh, between healthcare providers and families every day in wards or hallways and in clinics. Um, and it's really integrated within the process of, of healthcare delivery. And in speaking to some of the providers, this moment of, of training families is some of the most meaningful moments in their day of connecting with patients and, and of course their families. Um, after someone leaves a, a healthcare facility, we continue to stay connected with people over a shockingly powerful, but of course simple technology, texting. Um, we send reinforcement messages, reminders, videos, and uh, we as a team are on the other side to answer any questions. Um, and just to, just to summarize, our, our model is really about meeting people in their moments of need. Um, we support people to, to really learn and, and most importantly act, especially in their homes. Um, the model is something that we've seen applies to many different types of patients, uh, whether it's new parents, oncology patients, surgery patients, and, and really what the common thread is, is the family. They're there, they want to help, and their involvement helps the patient heal. And in turn, it helps the health systems as well. Uh, if you can advance to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our, our work spans India, but, but also Bangladesh. Um, we primarily work with the government. Uh, and right now we're in about uh, a little bit more than 160 facilities. Um, and our model is a, is a health system strengthening initiative. Our, our work is in partnership with the government typically, um, and it's baked into the budgets and, and the operations of how the government delivers care. Um, they're the ones who operate the program daily, and, and we are the ones who are there to kickstart partner, kickstart and, and support uh, the government in, in implementing this and sustaining it in the long run. Um, what's not shown here is our COVID-19 program, which actually reaches people outside of facilities and in their homes directly. So we get data from uh, a state in, in India and also the government of Bangladesh about COVID patients, and we're able to um, reach, reach out to them in their homes and, and train them, uh, their family caregivers, on how to um, manage symptoms, um, how to keep the family caregivers safe to reduce transmission, and also how and when to access care. Um, if you can advance to the, to the last slide, um, this approach, while it's incredibly simple and, and cost effective, uh, we've done evaluations that have enrolled tens of thousands of people in dozens of facilities all across India. And we've shown improvements in a variety of health behaviors like skin to skin uh, thermal care uh, for mothers and newborns, um, reduction in readmissions to, to facilities, and even reductions in, in complications after, after someone leaves a facility. Um, please reach out and, and you know, check out our website if you'd like to see any of these studies. Uh, I, can, I can post it in the here uh, in, in a moment. Um, and just thought I'd end with uh, how this is all associated with primary care. Um, we we at Nora really do believe that it takes a family to strengthen healthcare. Um, and we're really glad to be invited here to, to bring this perspective into how um, family caregiving and, and home care incorporates into broader uh, primary care initiatives um, and excited for the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Shahed, and thank you so much for just sharing um, how NeuroHealth's model has, um, you know, moved from one disease area and really morphed and, um, you know, brought into the uh, broader, you know, um, primary healthcare system. And so I want to just um, thank everyone for the great questions to both Javier and uh, Shahed. Unfortunately, we won't be taking those questions at this time, but we will have them join our panel. And I also want to just um, take the mo take a moment to just um, welcome our other panelists. We have a wonderful group of um, uh, professionals just joining us to just talk about, you know, what's uh, adapting to a new reality. What are the evolving models of primary healthcare? And so um, in addition to both um, Javier and Shahed, we have um, uh, Sue, uh, Sue Fabet. Uh, Sue is with uh, Virtual Health, where she uh, leads clinical operations um, and as the chief clinical operations officer, and she'll tell us a bit about, sorry, at Vera Health, where uh, Vera Whole Health, and she'll tell us a bit about what um, Vera does in the primary healthcare space. We also have Dr. Agatha Olago, who's with Kenya's Ministry of Health, and she's the head of division for the primary health services and family medicine team. And then finally, we have Dr. Tarun Kapoor, who's the senior vice president and chief digital transformation uh, office, uh, officer at Virtual Health. And uh, Tarun uh, leads Vatra's uh, Digital Transformation Office, and he is going to tell us a bit more about uh, what they're doing around digital uh, transformation. And so, um, yeah, thank you, everyone, and thanks for making time to uh, be with us and just share your um, your insights. So, first off, I'd want to um, maybe start with um, Sue and ask you um, give us a quick snapshot of what you're doing at Vera Whole Health and uh, in the area of primary care but especially um, your thoughts on what has significantly changed in primary care as your organization has been working in this space over the last few years. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanna just start off just really quickly how humbled I am to be a part of this with uh, the innovation and, um, and the care delivery that has been expressed thus far. Uh, it's um, it's amazing the work that's being done and the way people are looking at things differently. Uh, we at Vera Whole Health, uh, we are a um, advanced primary care uh, clinic. We have, we're located in 10 different states in the U.S., uh, have about 30 different uh, care center or care delivery areas. We believe in um, kind of that whole person care. We have our healthcare providers uh, and uh, we also have coaches that are embedded into our primary care model to help patients with behavior change, et cetera. We also have uh, behavioral health clinicians because as you know, whenever a patient wants to uh, seek health care, they bring everything with them. Uh, they're everything that's happened to them throughout their day, throughout their life, uh, that influences it. So we believe that behavioral health is a very important part of primary care. We also have analytics platforms where we work with um, our partners, whether they be employers or health plans, to really be able to formulate an appropriate outreach to be able to serve the population where, uh, where we sit. Uh, we're in a very innovative and uh, growth opportunity right now within, uh, within the industry as we look at uh, really making watching the uh, US healthcare system make some of that transition from quantity of healthcare and the number of patients that are brought in into much more that value-based care. Uh, our providers all are given uh, a lot of time to be able to see their patients. So roughly uh, you know, 30 minutes to an hour with their patients to really provide that connection. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the nutshell of, uh, of Vera and uh, excited to be here. So thank you. Thanks, Sue. And thank you so much for just talking about that shift towards value-based care. And I think we'll be exploring a bit more in this discussion. So over to you, Tarun. Um, let us know a bit more about um, what you're doing at Batra, as well as um, you know, uh, maybe one or two significant changes you've seen in the primary healthcare space. 
Uh, first of all, I uh, just want to echo Sue's comments. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Just uh, wonderful introductions uh, to learn about the great work that's already being done. So Tarun Kapoor, I'm a, I'm a uh, recovering hospitalist, as I like to say, uh, internal medicine trained uh, physician who uh, had an opportunity to, to work within an integrated delivery network, a traditional US-based integrated delivery network here at Virtua in the southern part of New Jersey over the last you know, 12, 13 years. And you know, I think what is an interesting dynamic or contrast is, is that you know, here's a traditional health system that was all based around sick care. And we're trying to you know, count, go the opposite direction of building from the behemoth to try, to try to reinvent ourselves from the inside out, surrounded all around by a lot of very innovative new entrants who are also saying, if you don't change yourself, we're going to make you change yourself, and and so you know it's sometimes we joke around as, as yes it's it's nice to be in a battleship uh, on stormy seas, but how do we become more nimble? And you know uh, taking a line from from Lou Gerstner and IBM, can we get this elephant to dance? And you know and I think that's where we are trying to think about things from from uh, a, tr a traditional integrated delivery network, but meeting our our consumers exactly where they are in their journey and. You know, I, I think that's, you know, a couple of lessons learned. Uh, I, I took over digital health just uh, relatively recently, actually just in late 2019. Our organization, we said, you know, let's see if we can do 500 telehealth visits uh, in 2020. And I, everyone's looking their eyes, like rolling their eyes over at me, and, you know, and, and a story that is not unique to Virtua, but, you know, everywhere else. Uh, lo and behold, the great COVID catalyst. You know, we've always talked about what was going to get a, a traditional integrated delivery network to change. Was it going to be Amazon? Was it going to be a, a new disruptive entrant? And lo and behold, it was an RNA virus. And so, you know, if there was something that was a wake up call, you know, we finished our year not at 500, but, you know, uh, we bumped up around 200,000 uh, digital health encounters last year. So how do we now keep that momentum going and not revert? back to the way we used to be wired to do things. So I think that's you know, just a great opportunity. It, it, obviously a huge tragedy from, from COVID, but there is an opportunity for the health systems, traditional health systems to try to reinvent themselves. Thank you so much, Tarun. And thank you just for talking about change, um, you know, just the pressures towards change, um, both for an established organization such as yours, but also due the, to the pandemic and we will uh, pick up on that thread soon uh, in the conversation. So over to you, Dr. Agatha, tell us a bit more about the work that your team is doing in primary health in Kenya and um, some of the significant changes or factors that have led to um, some of the exciting new things that you're doing. Okay, thank you so much, Patricia. Um, I think for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, so, um, uh, I'm a physician, um, actually uh, trained in internal medicine and currently heading a division of primary health services and family medicine. Um, it's a newly formed division. Uh, we previously didn't um, have that department of primary health care. And um, there's re the renewed interest in primary health care uh, presently, which led to the formation of this uh, new department, uh, primary health care in the Ministry of Health. Um, so currently what you are trying to do is actually trying to increase um, support, um, increase uh, financing, especially towards primary healthcare. And uh, we've faced quite a lot of challenges uh, within our systems. Um, we have a lot of fragmentation within the healthcare systems and especially at the lowest level, it's been quite a challenge. Um, so we ha we've had um, our system previously, our system has actually been, uh, it, it has actually been uh, uh, say in terms of the levels of healthcare. And we have the levels one being within the community, having that community health systems. We have the level two being the small facilities, the dispensaries, um, level three being at the health center level, and the level four being the sub-county, okay, presently now the sub-county hospital. And the challenge has been, especially for getting those actual services, at the lowest level, those dispensaries and health centers, they're the most in the country, yet they have the least, um, like the uh, least range of services. And also some, at some, at some point also the, um, the, aspect, the aspect of access to commodities or even the human resource as well investment there is actually quite low. 
So we've had uh, fragmentation due to everyone now going to the highest level of care. Um, currently with the country, especially focusing towards trying to attain universal health care, that has actually been proven to be a challenge because we noticed that a lot of people ended up going directly to the level six facilities. Those are usually the tertiary and referral hospitals. And um, it has actually increased the costs of healthcare. So uh, especially forming this uh, primary healthcare department has actually given at least some stimulus towards increasing support um, of the counties as well towards um, even increasing the interest of the counties towards um, investing in the primary healthcare. So we are looking at, uh, we've, been, we've been trying to support um, establishment of primary healthcare networks um, within the counties. Uh, and they're currently, we're still um, developing guidelines of this. They've actually just um, recently been signed off and we've uh, done a pilot um, at least in one or two counties but you're actually just starting um, implementation towards this. We've only been sitting down and trying to figure out how can we do this um, best within our setting. Um, so the PCNs actually try to link um, that primary healthcare system um, straight from the communities um, to the dispensaries, health centers, and the sub-county hospitals that we have. And in that, it's bringing in um, support as well um, for the communities and those health, and health centers and dispensaries. Um, in a way that the sub-county hospital are able to support the lower level facilities, uh, brings in the issue of quality, brings in the issue of access, as well as um, ensuring that we have the capacity to cater for um, the populations around them. So um, we really haven't um, done so much. We've just been in the process of development and, uh, um, but we've learned quite a bit um, even through that. We've had to have a lot of engagement um, with a lot of the county teams, a lot of the um, health facility teams as well. And it really helped us to um, try and see how we can actually improve this. We've uh, recently gotten support, at least when it comes to implementation. And we hope to also get a, a, quite a lot of support going forward in terms of implementation of these, uh, of the PCNs um, in the counties. Thank you so much, Agatha, and thank you for bringing this really uh, unique perspective of a policymaker and trying to steward that process of change from a fragmented system that maybe does not quite value primary care towards more integrated uh, service delivery. And um, I think we'll be bringing in, um, you know, your perspective and Kenya's unique journey, um, especially in light of, um, you know, creating efficiencies that are required to advance universal health coverage. And so I want to now. Um, you know, just uh, pivot to, you know, uh, COVID-19. I mean, it's, um, we're in this era and we cannot um, avoid talking about, you know, what has been the impact of the ongoing uh, global pandemic on primary healthcare models. And so I want to start off with Shahed and then Javier as well, to just tell us a bit more about, you know, what have you seen has shifted within this period, um, you know, as the countries that you serve um, have, have gone through different stages of the pandemic. And more importantly for your organization, what insights or lessons are you taking that are going to shape how you deliver primary healthcare? So first off, Shahed and Javier, and then I'll invite everyone else. Over to you, Shahed. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the, what, what we've seen is, is COVID has, especially in India with the in, intense resource crunch um, that, that we all have you know, seen in the news and the images that we've seen, it really has um, pushed us to, to rethink um, structures of care and, and the importance of, of supporting better primary care systems. Um, and it's allowed us to, as an organization, um, adapt our model for, uh, for delivering our, our support in a way that um, does not depend on a physical infrastructure, a facility, a person actually visiting, uh, visiting a facility. Um, and that was a big shift for us. And a, a big thing that, uh, um, that we needed to grapple with is that we do believe in um, the power of communication when it happens person to person and, and how that, even if you're repeating the same thing um, over and over, it does matter when you when you get to when you get to hear it from another person, and so how how we combined um, uh, you know live interaction and live counseling with 
technology driven approaches was was really important. And as I was mentioning in, in our introduction, a lot of our training of, of caregivers of, of COVID patients couldn't happen in facilities. They needed to just happen in the homes. That's where you know 90% of, of people needed to heal. Um, and, and so our our shift of, of uh, you know kind of moving our model to, to a remote remote first uh, initiative was important. And, and I think what was what was really um, uh, you know what was really the learning there is how do we continue to have the, the benefits of that in-person engagement still happen through these remote instances, but still be able to leverage kind of efficiencies of, of technology. Um, and hopefully we're able to use some of these tailwinds to, to uh, be able to reach to uh, other types of patients, not just COVID patients that don't necessarily need to visit a facility to receive care. And in our instance, to receive the type of training and support um, that their family caregivers would need to get. Thank you so much. Uh, Javier? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, so in the case of Mexico, it, it created a lot of awareness uh, the diabetes care. And um, I, I just, uh, and I remember before COVID-19, I was speaking with uh, one of, uh, the dad of one of my best friends and he had an, he, he had an A1C of 8.5%. Uh, and he was sharing with me that uh, the doctor recommend him that, well, he was already uh, 75 years old, that not to worry too much because of his age. And, uh, and then he was one of the first uh, people to die from COVID-19. And so we realized that, uh, I mean, having your diabetes or hypertension uncontrolled really matters. And uh, what we saw, well, definitely a huge increase in patients. Uh, last year, just a few months after COVID, we, we had 40% uh, more patients in our clinics. It was really a challenge because we have to protect the safety of our staff and patients with also the the uh, people coming in, but uh, we, we just saw the huge need of more information, more education. People really were seeking answers of how can I be better prepared if, if I get uh, COVID. And uh, so from, from the uh, company perspective, we have to very rapidly, so, so one is to uh, in, uh, include tools like uh, video consultation, phone consultations, and uh, to reach out to patients and um, as how, we, how we, uh, they were dealing in, uh, at their homes and uh, with the pandemic. And, and at the same time, how we could uh, create more efficiencies and technology to really personalize and, and be more like focus on, on what to do for a specific patients. Uh, at the same time, many of our patients lost their jobs. So about 20% of our patients lost their jobs. So how we can, help them navigate these months while they were getting a new job and, and, and getting back. So th there was a lot of uh, uh, transformation internally and around the country of how we see uh, diabetes. What, what do I look for? And, and, and the role that we play is, well, definitely there was, I, I think humankind, we, there, there were a lot of resources, talent, focus to solve and, and of course, what we're seeing right now, I just got my vaccine a couple of weeks ago. And, and really to me, that was, it was the, how we were closing this loop of from more than a year ago when we were reacting to the suffering, to, to the adjustments, to getting to where we are starting to get. Uh, and and uh, so hopefully we can see that in diabetes as well. I mean, it's killing triple or four more people than than COVID, so how we can really focus our resources, our talent, work together to find solutions for uh, for these type of diseases. And I think the role we're playing in primary care, integrated care, uh, care, I think is really key for that. Thank you so much, Javier. I think just those themes around you know shifting care to where patients are, meeting them where they are. And then also just having a focus on, you know, at risk groups. I think Taruni had started telling us a bit about, you know, uh, Vatra's um, journey into telehealth. And so, and you did say that uh, COVID-19 really accelerated transformation uh, in that space. Um, yeah, tell us a bit more. What has been the impact of the pandemic and what are you going to integrate going forward? So, so you know, one, I think one of the things that we had always said to ourselves 
was, well, this is going to be harder for our, our consumers, our patients to, to, to adopt, right? And, and the, great, the great catalyst of, of COVID was people had no choice but to adopt during this time. If you couldn't come in in person, you had to figure it out. And then people figured it out. Uh, and the same thing happened on the clinician side, right? Our clinicians had no other choice but to figure it out. And we were worried about change management. You know, we started things through, okay, how do we go through all of these fancy tools? And then, you know, necessity is the mother of adoption and invention. And it's amazing the resilience of people, right? And, and so it, it's a great reminder. Sometimes you just have to pull the bandaid and do it. And now, you know, if, if anything, you just force the opportunity to happen and see what happens. And then what do you learn from that? You know, I, I think the other thing that is really important and I think is, is emerging as a theme from, from the other speakers here is this is still fundamentally an analog business, right? We have all of these digital tools and they can be augmenting, but they're not necessarily, in some cases, they may be able to replace some of the interactions, but otherwise we're talking about it's human to human contact, you know, whether you, you're taking chapter out of the tool, Gawande's article about slow ideas, you know, the work that Shahid's doing and, and Javier are doing, it's, it's literally having these interactions with people. I'm constantly on calls with startups um, out of Silicon Valley say, hey, listen, we can do this 100% digitally. We don't need human beings. And the answer is, let's just see, you know, because do you think you can change a behavior? You can actually make an engagement with somebody just from, from a voice. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. We're all analog beings. Yes, we're using digital tools right now to, to meet, but we're fundamentally having an analog meeting using digital enhancements. So I, I think this, this belief that it's gonna be digital only is really misguided versus how do you digitally integrate and, and, and find out, you know, you know, this is a time for ease and convenience. A vaccination, I would think of that way as ease and convenience. At Virtua, you know, we recognize we don't care where you get your vaccine, just get it. You don't have to get it with us. What we want to do, though, is we want the digital tool to make sure that we got a record of it from wherever you get it from. But there are things that we, there are people that don't want ease and convenience for. They want a face-to-face -face conversation, especially when it may be around bad news. Right. I, I don't know if I necessarily want to be going over bad news over a digital encounter. I want to be having that face to face. And and I think if we can use our digital tools to understand where people are and sub segment them, say, yep, that's easy convenience. Let's go as fast as possible. This is a meaningful face to face opportunity to change. Then I think those will be the more successful users of integrated medicine, digitally integrated medicine. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you for just emphasizing, you know, the that aspect of, you know, digital augmenting, but then still at the heart of primary care is individuals. And I think, Sue, you mentioned that, um, you know, at Vera, you're basically looking at the whole human. What has been the impact of the pandemic um, on your model and what lessons are you taking away? I couldn't agree more with Karen in regards to it's that balance of virtual and in-person. There is that human connection component that is so incredibly important. One of the things that we saw with, uh, with the transformation uh, through COVID was um, people's anxiety levels and their discomfort levels really escalated. We quickly turned on, we did not have a digital platform uh, prior to COVID. We were in the process of, uh, of preparing to launch one, but uh, whenever, whenever the pandemic occurred, we needed to quickly turn something on. So we utilized actually the digital platform that we're on today on this call. We have a, a privacy component, um, one that gave opportunity for us to be able to do uh, immediate care with our patients. Uh, you know, the, our providers had to do a transformation. Uh, to your point, the, um, you know, the, the urgency kind of forced them to, to do it quickly. Uh, but it's 
it's very different on how you connect with patients um, digitally versus in person, especially whenever you're a very high touch organization. Uh, so that was a that was a big learning curve for our providers and for the remainder of our care team. Um, we got initially a uh, mixed adoption, quite honestly, from our patients in wanting to do virtual visits. Many of them still were asked, we had a, a large percentage that wanted to still come in or wanted to do it just strictly telephonically because they didn't like being on camera. Uh, the other component though was there was that other chunk of people that were scared to leave their homes and didn't know how to kind of uh, maneuver and, uh, and get through some of that anxiety component. One of the things that we instituted along with the virtual care for our patients by our providers was uh, some group coaching sessions. We did, um, we did sessions with our health coaches where uh, they talked through how to decrease anxiety, decrease some of their um, uh, uh, their isolation feelings and uh, provided some connection uh, with other individuals, either in their communities or not, uh, through some of our group coaching sessions. We also had uh, behavioral health sessions that we also instituted pretty quickly into that virtual platform. Um, we did uh, virtual yoga so that people were actually getting up and starting to move and, and do that in conjunction with their, uh, with their healthcare provider. Um, you know, virtual cooking classes and different things like that so that we could really um, kind of look at that whole person and figure out the different aspects that they may need that connection. Um, you know, because as we, uh, you know, as we stated earlier, whenever a patient comes in for a visit, they bring all of their baggage with them. And so trying to figure out how you can alleviate some of, um, some of those aspects uh, through some of these other modalities and connections is incredibly important. And it really forced our entire organization to, uh, to look at how we could reach our patients differently. It also forced our partners. So many of our partners are um, our employer groups they were also going through a tremendous amount of transformation, whether it was suddenly having to learn themselves how to deal with all of their workers being remote, or whether it was, um, you know, just the, uh, what do we do with, uh, with people who uh, contract uh, COVID, et cetera. So being able to provide that, that full loop service to help both the employer groups the patients that we're working with, and then also to address um, the, the feelings of isolation, anxiety, uh, the trepidation that folks felt. Uh, it really focused us to, to look at that whole person differently and how we could reach out to them. Thank you so much. And so Agatha, I think uh, we've listened to four providers in very different contexts. And just, you know, what has been what has been the impact of this, um, you know, event or, you know, um, season on their models um, and on the different stakeholders that they have. And so from a more, uh, you know, broader policymaker point of view, um, you know, at a time when Kenya was trying to think around integrated primary care and introduce new service delivery models, then the COVID-19 pandemic happened. What have you seen have been the impact on primary care? And has this been like an opportunity to push forward or have you had any challenges as you're thinking of this broader transformation uh, on primary care in the country? Okay, thank you. Sorry, it took a while to get unmuted. Um, thank you. So I know with the COVID pandemic, um, we already had um, fragile health systems. I think I'd uh, mentioned that earlier. So it proved uh, a bigger challenge. Um, and I know, so one of the uh, ways that, um, some of the challenges that we actually faced at that time, when we had um, a lot of restriction and uh, restriction measures being pl uh, put in place due to the pandemic, uh, flights being stopped, um, a lot of um, restrictions on travel, um, even in between counties, um, that posed actually uh, a challenge to people accessing care 
Um, some people usually have to go, we've had uh, people having to travel for care, especially specialized care, mostly going to the cities um, like Nairobi, where we have more of the health, pro um, the specialist um, concentrated more, more likely in the cities like Nairobi, Mombasa, um, and currently maybe even Nakuru, Kisumu. So most people were able to travel in between counties, so proved a challenge to accessing some care. Um, we also uh, noted, especially as um, due to the issues such as curfew, um, those challenges in accessing, um, uh, for example, even um, deliveries at night had a challenge, especially accessing some of those services. Uh, we actually noticed a drop in coverage in um, some certain health services, antenatal clinics, um, especially a lot of our preventive and promotive immunization clinics actually took a, quite a, a large drop. And um, I think following that, we had to actually give um, uh, those actually the advice being given uh, by the government regarding ensuring that the um, services are being provided in primary healthcare facilities. So for example, for the child, um, the child program, they had to give um, advice and guidelines regarding um, accessing services such as immunization to ensure that they were available and they were still safe. And they had to put, we had to put structures in place that ensure that these services were still available um, in these areas. Um, like at the beginning, a lot of the clinics, um, elective clinics, um, um, elective surgeries had been stopped. Um, guidance had been given to that effect due to a lot of the staff being um, uh, drawn away from these areas uh, to provide a lot of the surge for COVID um, coverage. Uh, so these services had been stopped. A lot of the clinics for diabetes, hypertension, um, a lot of the non-communicable diseases had been stopped at this point. And uh, we noticed that there was actually going to be a problem going forward. Um, and especially when we realized um, that um, a lot of the uh, severe disease was concentrated, especially among the hypertensives, the diabetics. So uh, we're able to give guidance to the effect of um, that these clinics still needed to continue. And we had to also advise on how this should happen. So this uh, we were able to do. And um, uh, I think probably one uh, plus that it gave us that the aspect, the interest in technology um, that it brought about, uh, were able to carry out quite a lot of trainings on COVID, um, on COVID uh, case management um, online, a lot of um, sensitizations on, on even infection prevention and control were carried out um, uh, virtually. So this was actually quite a plus in terms of improving um, telehealth. So uh, uh, it also just uh, made us uh, realize that we had quite a gap of in terms of policy, um, regulation of um, e-health, um, even clinicians, a lot of private um, clinicians were now asking, how do we ensure that you can get payments even when we carry out consultation, um, uh, when you carry out these teleconsultations. So it's, I wouldn't say it's taken, um, uh, it's taken um, off um, that well, especially the aspect of teleconsultations, because people still really want that face-to-face um, -face, um, meeting. But it has certainly um, it's taken it quite a step ahead. Uh, so there's also been, um, in general, I'd say for in terms of primary health care, it also brought in the interest of a lot of um, enablers in healthcare. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussions um, in terms of primary health care not just within the health fraternity, but also from outside. Uh, okay, let me not call them outside, but a lot of the enablers um, bringing in people. So it's the same discussions we should be having um, regarding universal healthcare. And this has really brought in um, everyone else on board, the ICT ministry. It's brought in uh, a lot of players that should ideally be on the table, even as you're thinking around social determinants of health. Um, we know that it's not only um, among um, health professionals, uh, it needs to be everyone talking about health. So I'd say um, the COVID pandemic actually brought um, everyone on the table regarding that. Um, in terms of, uh, especially the aspects of um, even screening, um, I'd say there's actually been increase um, in screening for non-communicable diseases. A lot of screening for hypertension, diabetes, and that's actually been noticeable um, in our um, the data that we're able to so that's something that I would say is a plus, especially for in terms of even increasing knowledge on um, uh, people's status in terms of the non-communicable diseases. 
uh, we've, so it's brought in that interest in prevention and uh, promotive aspect that you're hoping will actually stay on. Um, we also worked, um, especially in times, in, to bring up the aspect of home-based care. Uh, previously, it wasn't really um, something that had been adopted. I think COVID really brought it back because we, we had to develop those home-based care guidelines first. And looking forward, I think we are looking at them not st um, staying with COVID uh, management alone, but also other conditions as well. I know it's also opened a way for cancer management, um, palliative care, I mean, um, in terms of um, having that uh, within the home-based care. Um, we've seen a lot of private um, uh, providers also um, looking at that home-based care model as well. So I think that's something that um, will, ha it has opened up to also having um, some regulation around that aspect as well. Um, having a lot of um, the digital health as well, we've had, we've had to do a lot of surveys um, digitally, um, especially a lot of our um, knowledge, attitude and practice surveys, even just looking at our readiness of health facilities, we're able to carry out quite a number of um, surveys um, virtually and on telephone. And this has actually, um, we hadn't, we had never thought around such approaches, um, especially from the Ministry of Health aspect. So I'd say, uh, but it's come, COVID has come with its challenges, but it's also opened up quite a lot of opportunities in terms of innovation in the health sector. And uh, we're hoping that we can actually document and skill um, a lot of these um, uh, approaches. Okay, thank you so much. And um, just wanted to remind um, our audience that we are taking questions. I've seen a couple of these questions. And um, so I'll just um, ask one more thing, um, you know, just to tie this up. I think we've really focused on, you know, one, um, you know, uh, emerging issue that has brought around um, accelerated change in how primary care is delivered across different areas. You know, we've um, talked about, you know, this uh, shift towards digital, but then the balance between, um, you know, maintaining that human connection, um, centering care around the individual patient, their family and community, but also how this has really um, allowed innovation in terms of, you know, what kind of care can be done or provided within the home setting, um, you know, where bringing really truly bringing care to where the patient is at. Um, and I think just certain themes around, um, you know, the lessons that different um, health systems and provider groups are going to take, as well as also what Agatha has brought about in terms of, you know, regulation of new areas, um, you know, such as um, telehealth, um, teleconsultations. And so just thinking around, you know, what are the policy impacts of this rapid accelerated change? And so I just wanted to kind of talk about um, healthcare professionals um, and not, uh, not really around um, COVID-19, but then even as we've tried to, in our different contexts, to bring about integrated primary healthcare, have you seen the role of healthcare professionals shifting? And in what ways have you seen that shifting? Um, and then after that, um, you know, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. And so I'll ask um, Shahed to start us off. Um, you know, because I think uh, your model is really, really uh, focused on, you know, um, healthcare professionals and shifting their role. Um, tell us a bit more, just very briefly, just in, in, in the interest of time. How have you seen, as you've tried to um, roll this out across multiple disease areas, the role of the professional? Sorry, Shahed, you might be unmuted. You might be muted. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, having trouble unmuting again. Uh, just to be really, really brief, I suppose, um, I, I think our, our whole model is based off the fact that a lot of what healthcare professionals end up doing um, can be strengthened through uh, what, what families are doing. And, and there's a lot of care happening in the home and how can we leverage that effectively? Uh, of course, not task shifting away, you know, medical and clinical tasks from, um, from, from healthcare professionals, but how do we uh, strengthen that with, with, with families? And, and that's really where, where Nora comes in. And um, we've seen, again, you know, from some of our research, how being able to, having, having families play that role ends up improving health outcomes, improving behavior change. So it, it really can be a, um, a way to 
to, to improve, yeah, just improve the efficiencies within the health system through the perspective of, you know, better leveraging a healthcare professional's time. Um, and just the only thing that I'll add right now, honestly, our focus in working with the healthcare providers um, in the midst of this pandemic uh, in the second wave in India is all about their wellness um, and uh, recognizing the immense burden uh, and, and the most important person, the most important thing within the, the health system right now is not the ventilator, it's not the oxygen concentrator that's that's there in the facilities. Um, it's 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 the people who are who are providing that care and how can we be there for them? Um, and so we we are also recognizing that uh, to to bring in models that that help um, help support providers. Uh, help task shift wherever there's wherever it's it's appropriate is incredibly important, um, and really just kind of uh, focusing on on their wellness also in in that process is is incredibly important. And how we do that uh, is is by listening. And and anytime we bring in an intervention and uh, and a training, the the first part of it is just listening. What do you think that this? Uh, how will this shift your role? How can this help your uh, your um, role within the within within the healthcare setting and um and of course you know that that helps us then refine our model thank you thanks your head so i'll turn this over to you tarun um in what ways as you find roll out an integrated new primary healthcare uh model have you seen uh the role of professionals shifting so so one of the things in in training your know, residency training is we are taught that you know at the end of your training you should know everything and you know with medical knowledge now doubling pretty much around that 90 day mark right it's literally doubling every 90 days if we continue to tell our our, our healthcare professionals you will know everything right we're setting them up for imminent failure so we spend a lot of time actually undoing, and I've been spending the last 12 years of my career undoing what I learned in training, and that is I am to know everything. But what I, what we do have to teach our providers is moving away from being a transactionalist, that only you can solve a problem. And only by you having direct control over it will you be able to solve a problem. To the mindset of you're going to, we really need you to manage uncertainty and things that do not necessarily respond to the patterns that we normally would expect you to. And so it's this mindset change, we think, of maybe not seeing 18, 20, 30 patients a day. You may only see the eight people who do not follow the pattern, but the rest of the team is going to see the other 100, but you're responsible for the whole thing, right? And, and getting that mindset across is a complete undoing of legacy training. Uh, and I think that's a really important uh, uh, approach and telling people it's okay, you can't know everything. That's a huge shift. Thank you so much. And I see Javier like really nodding and resonating with that. What's been your experience in clinicals around, you know, the shifting role of healthcare professionals in your model? Um, well, what I saw, it, uh, it was a tremendous engagement uh, as the, I mean, we were shifting, finding technologies. The, I think before there was two separate departments, the medical department and the healthcare professionals and the technology department. And then from one day to another, they were working really together, finding solutions. And, and I, I will say that there are two things that I see differently now is that uh, the helper team understands that the patient, that, that the healthcare is part of, an, of a, just an overall and uh, life of a patient. So how we tap into that and how we integrate, not only within the clinic as an integrated system, but how we integrate with the, all the other activities. So that's when you start thinking about more convenience, about options to the patients. And, and I would say that's the other, the, the second part that, that we are understanding that patient wants options. So I think before we wanted to uh, like a one solution and just as uh, Sue mentioned, we, we see the same that people, sometimes they like to take a phone consultation because they, they don't like to be seen in camera, but sometimes they, they like video for certain reasons. Sometimes they just want to log into the app and make an appointment. And for other things, they want to come to the clinic and sit with the doctor. So we are realizing that 
the more options we give to the patient, the better experience. And also as the as a professionals, uh, they feel much better that they're really nailing the, uh, the, the experience and the solutions for the patients. So much, so much more engagement, I will say. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just make time in our last couple of minutes for um, one question from the audience, uh, which I think is really something we've touched on. You know, what's been the role of the voice of patients and families um, as you've driven your integrated um, experience, primary care experience, what has been the role of patients and families in shaping your innovations? And maybe Sue, um, you could start us off by giving us one example of an innovation that you have made in your system that's been in response to, you know, user needs or patient needs. Yeah. I think um, whenever you think about um, the transformation that, that's occurring right now, uh, it is uh, also that the, that the healthcare provider is, is a partner in, uh, in the healthcare instead of the director of the healthcare. And as part of that partner, it becomes not only whenever we talk about whole person care, it's really all of the, the family or however the patient defines their family that surrounds them that really affects and directs their care. Uh, we do a lot, of, um, a lot of surveying and interactions and group, uh, group sessions with our patients and their family members to figure out what the next step is for them. So we are looking at some technology uh, components where it will integrate, integrate not just the patient from through portal access, et cetera, but also the additional caregivers that, that touch them. Our telehealth platform allows us to bring in up to five or six other members into that visit. And that's done specifically so that we can integrate and bring in the other family members as needed if that patient wishes, uh, which was an incredibly important um, aspect whenever we started talking to our, our patients about how they wanted a telehealth uh, visit as we were building out our, our uh, long-term platform. Um, even integrating and bringing the patients into, um, or the family members into the coaching visits uh, we're trying to look at expansion of our integrated behavioral health to also include some of the family dynamics. We've brought in social workers uh, based on the need that we've seen for addressing the social determinants of health and also assuring and educating the families in how to take care of uh, some of our um, more elderly patients, et cetera. So it's been a lot more, less about a specific level of, in, of innovation and much more about looking at the continuum of how we care for our patients and where the families and, uh, and the individual patients need, uh, need and are directing some of that, uh, some of that healthcare through their partnership. Thank you, Sue. And so I think that's such a wonderful note to end this uh, discussion on. I mean, we've covered quite a bit, um, really talked about, you know, just a wonderful, um, you know, global landscape of, you know, from uh, India all the way, you know, passing through Kenya, the US and um, also in Mexico, just, you know, how is primary care being de uh, delivered? How are, you know, um, different provider groups and governments thinking about changing how primary care is being delivered to actually meet patients where they and their families where they're at? Um, what's been the role or what has, um, what's been the impact of the ongoing pandemic on how care is being delivered, but then finally really, um, you know, how do you assist um, healthcare professionals also uh, adapt to this change that is really at the, you know, in response to the needs of their patients whom they value and who are the really the drivers of primary care. And so thank you so much. Join me in just thanking our panelists um, just for sharing your wisdom and your wonderful insights. And this has been such a wonderful and rich discussion. And so I want to turn over to um, my colleague, uh, Ryan Hamel, who is with Vinamic. And so Ryan is going to take us uh, uh, take over from here. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, Patricia, thank you for facilitating that amazing uh, session. It was really lovely to hear some friends and some colleagues talk a little bit about, you know, what I refer to as empathetic innovation when it comes to primary care. That's what I heard. And we traverse the globe. And, and I'm 
honored and, and lucky enough to introduce our next um, exciting speaker, and, and that's Dr. Ali Parsa. And he's a British Iranian healthcare entrepreneur and engineer. He's the founder and CEO of Babylon, uh, which is a revolutionary AI and digital health company. Uh, Babylon's mission, if you don't know, is to put an accessible and affordable health service in the hands of every person on earth. And Dr. Parsa uh, has been listed in the Times 100 People to Watch. He's been featured in the Maserati 100. And that list recognizes game-changing entrepreneurs. And he was formerly a UK cabinet office ambassador uh, for mutuals and the chair of confederation of the British industry tech forum. And he's got a PhD in engineering physics. So we're so excited to hear what he has to bring to us. And then we're gonna break into a panel. So Dr. Parsa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. Um, uh, let, I am a physicist, obviously not a very successful one. That's why I'm not practicing physics. But the, uh, in physics, we have a very famous paper. Uh, it was written by a scientist at the turn of the century called Lawrence. And, he, uh, and the title of the paper, many of you know, uh, it is the flap of a bat butterfly's wings in Brazil can set off a tornado in Texas. And of course, what we forget is the second part of the title of that paper, which is, or it can equally not. And uh, so I have been asked to talk about how would primary care look like in five years time. And of course, as a physicist, I know that it is almost impossible to predict the future five days from now, let alone five years from now. So instead of attempting to do something that I am sure would look completely wrong in a few weeks, instead I thought that I just share with you what is happening today, not so much in primary care, but in the environment in which healthcare is going to exist, uh, coexist with all the other uh, areas of our lives, which are being affected by technology, but also in my view, increasingly by changes and advances in biology. So to that end, I wanted to kind of ask you to just think about six, six events that are happening in the technology world around us. All of that, it's a promise today. Some of that has already been starting to roll out, but almost, invariably all of it will be there five years from today. The first is the promise of quantum computing. So when you think about technology or artificial intelligence today, you're thinking about what is possible on advanced supercomputers of today. But a quantum computer is not only 100, 200, or 1,000 times faster than a supercomputer, a quantum computer is a hundred million times faster and more powerful. That means if our artificial intelligence today can sit on the back of a snake, a quantum computer is not a cheetah, the fastest moving animal on earth, is not a rocket ship, but it's 137 times faster than a space, than, than the Star Trek a spaceship that we grew up with as a child. Secondly, we've already seen the advance of 5G across the globe. 5G, as you know, is not just faster than 4G, but it's a hundredfold faster than 4G. So if our ability today to transfer, to, uh, transfer mobile data is uh, like putting it on the back of a turtle, it, 5G is not just putting it on a bicycle, but it's putting it on a supersonic jet to get it to people. Three is that we are assumed to go from 2 billion to, to 200 billion devices that are connected on the internet of everything in five years from now. That means that, that we don't just have Apple watches or Samsung watches or phones that are connected to the internet, but our clothes, our shoes, every item we touch and we know is a connected item. 
by the time we are thinking what kind of primary care there is going to be five years from now. Also, we are going from predictive analytics to prescriptive, uh, prescriptive analytics. That means that our artificial intelligence is not just going to think about what is going to happen, but how is it going to happen, when and where and under what circumstances. So think of the way that we used to do weather predictions only 10, 20 years ago versus the way we do weather predictions today with the level of certainty and clarity that we could create nowadays. Five, we're going from the world in which we operate on basic phone call uh, uh, to the uh, side of the screens to interact with the internet to the world of augmented reality where the internet and all the knowledge it has in the world can be summarized in the glasses we wear. A world of augmented reality that almost all the information can always be available to all of us all of the time. And six, we're going to see, and we already are, seeing that all of that coming to the physical world through the robots that can dance, can even walk, that can perform duties. We're already seeing during the COVID period, those robots in the parks of Singapore, keeping the distance between human beings to the two meter level. For those of us who want to go and think about what primary care is gonna look like in five years from now, but think about it in the context of today's technology, in the meaningless context of I can send you a WhatsApp or I can just do a video conferencing versus I'm thinking about what do all these capabilities that are being built in the world of technology today will enable me to do five years from now. Because we in healthcare can sit back and wait for the rest of the world to take advantage of this. Or we could be among the pioneers that take advantage of these uh, 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 advancements and bring it into our people to help them experience a better model of care. But if this is what is happening in technology, it is almost, it almost pales into insignificance compared to what is happening in the world of biology. Not only today, we have immunotherapies and protein therapies and all the things that have led to significant advances in even the vaccines that came up on COVID. Remember, uh, only a few years ago, it would have taken 10 years to develop a vaccine. We developed a vaccine in one year, uh, and, and, uh, and in some places even less, against COVID by the advancements that are happening in the world of biology. But we are also seeing today people being able to manufacture organs, to create robots that can carry on, that can travel through our bodies and unblock our veins. We've seen robots that can be added to us as a skeletons for people who cannot walk to use those robots as outside the skeleton devices to help them walk. We've seen human beings that are connected with devices where our brain can operate machines without our hands. We've seen monkeys that are connected to a hand through reading of the mind that the hand can move in another continent. We've seen machines that can read the mind. We've seen advances in synthetic biology that has mixed the genes or gene therapy that have mixed the genes of a jellyfish with the fish to make the fish radiant and in different colors. These are all the things that are happening today in our laboratories. We've seen mice who's been added with the genes of a, a bird and can sing like a bird. We've seen a mice that can become a a, a, a 10 times more intelligent than normal mice through the blockage uh, of the BBT prone, uh, protein. We've seen a worm that can live 10 times longer and a tomato that the deterioration of the telomeres in it has stopped so it can have uh, almost does not age. So why am I sharing this with you? Because I think that any gathering of healthcare professionals that think about what the future is gonna look like cannot look at the future from the advancements of today 
but needs to look at the future where the future is. Otherwise, we will watch and see that somebody from completely outside our industry will come and change our industry. Believe me, if this was a gathering of, um, uh, if this was a gathering of uh, librarians in 1995 or in 2000, and we were sitting here and talk about advancement in libraries on how to distribute technology. And all we were talking about is how we can put computers in the libraries. And then a company like Google was coming around at the time and not thinking about what we could do with libraries, but thinking about how do we solve the problem in a fundamentally different way. And the different way, of course, for Google was how do I deliver uh, information from the internet to everybody without the use of any libraries. So if we think about healthcare, I think we need to stop thinking about what we do today, but think about what is possible tomorrow. So imagine a model of healthcare that is not about just fixing a broken body. Remember 20, 30 years ago when we used to drive our cars and when we drove it, it used to break down and we had no idea why it broke down and completely surprised we will take it to a mechanic who will then find out what to do with it and fix it. And then we drove it again until it broke down and we took it to a mechanic on an emergency again. That is the kind of medicine, by and large, we practice today. It is not healthcare, it's sick care. But imagine a world in which we can do with our body what we do with our car. Because today in our cars, we buried enough sensors that can monitor every aspect of the mechanics of our car, that can warn us pre the car breaking down and tell us how we should look after it ahead of a crisis happening. Whose car breaks down anymore? Our cars have almost nowadays don't break down. As we drive on this road, we hardly ever see what we used to see, which was a stream of cars intermittently broken down on the side, help, waiting for help. Imagine a model of healthcare that we can take a human being and collect continuously through time in every information from them, not just from their medical record, but also from the watch, from the phone they carry, from any interaction they have with anything that is connected to the internet, that we continuously health assess them based on that and risk assess them, that we set up, uh, we get insights that look and simulate the future of how their, uh, be, uh, their body is going to perform continue, uh, based on what we are seeing that we set them goals, that we set them plans, that we monitor them through those goals and plans for ourselves as practitioners, but also for them, and then reward people for staying healthy rather than spend money on them when they go sick. Now, invariably, a human being will go ill, and invariably, our cars break down. But when it does, instead of taking it too late, because we're monitoring them, we can see it really early, and therefore be able to do more and intervene early and deal with a problem when it's a $10 solution rather than when it becomes a $1,000 solution. As, as we intervene, instead of waiting to see that, what does a clinician says, and you and I both know, they take 17 years for best practice in medicine to become common practice. Instead of waiting 17 years and not knowing where our doctor or nurse is in that spectrum, knowing that they work on a platform that, that immediately and simultaneously distributes knowledge among them so that we, every person can get the right expertise, get the right treatment, the most modern up-to-date treatment, and then more importantly, is being looked after through that period of treatment. That model of healthcare that is proactive first, preventative first, and only deals with sick care when necessary. And when it does so, it does so in a standardized way, I think it's possible for us to do. We, all of us, this generation of healthcare practitioners, we sit on a threshold of a time that it is possible to reinvent the model of delivery of health. We should not spend all of our time just thinking about the legacy that we have had but to spend our time thinking about the possibilities, the potentials of what can be 
open to us with all the advancements in technology and biology. I hope that I have not stretched too far from the, what I was asked to do, but I listened to this conversation earlier today. I benefited a lot from what people are doing today and how they're thinking about using the current technology to improve their model of delivery. But I think it's important that we equally think about how do we use the more up-to-date technology not something that has already become commonplace, but something that is at the cutting edge to define the service that we take to our people. Remember, our people are still waiting for us. 50% of the world population has no access to health. Of those who do, many have very little access to more specialist current of healthcare. Five out of seven billion people have no access to secondary care. In the rich countries, many have very little access to mental health care. And as you know, there is no health care without mental health. On that, on that promise, on that hope that we can reinvent health care with the technologies that there are. So five years from now, we're thinking about a different model rather than incremental nuances on this model. There, I'll stop here and I'm grateful for you to, uh, for, for your time. Well, Dr. Parsa, on behalf of all of us, thank you for all of your energy and your thoughts and your ideas. This has really been um, an amazing quick speech around, you know, the idea of leapfrog technology and, and you've inspired us uh, to think a little bit more upstream and preventing and using systems now. So we're so grateful for you to take some time and share your thoughts with us. Um, and we're gonna roll right into um, this, this next panel. We're really excited to hear this session and this second panel is gonna operate very similar than the, as the first panel. We're gonna focus this time um, springboarding after, um, off of Dr. Parse's great energy around how we can look ahead and kind of play the role of futurists and what could primary care look like globally in, in one, three, five years. How will technologies, data science policy, and financing models affect how we deliver our healthcare? We're going to first hear from some incredible innovators, um, and then we're going to go right into the panel. So um, as we start off this panel, I think we're going to start with uh, Shelly Sexana, who is the founder and CEO of Sevamob. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Shelly, um, which is an, uh, Sevamob is an AI-enabled primary healthcare company. He's going to tell us how they've used AI to kind of create real outcomes and cut the cost of primary care. And after Shelley gives a brief overview, we're gonna hear from Lila Krukshank, uh, Krukshank excuse me. Um, she's the chief operating officer of One Family Health. So without further ado, Shelley, why don't you kick us off? Good morning. Uh, Ryan and Innovations in Healthcare, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Parsa, you set up this session pretty nicely and uh, we are uh, solving just one small problem in that vision which you um, outlined in the previous uh, uh, keynote. Um, so uh, if you can, next slide please. Yeah. So underserved areas have a scarcity of medical staff and diagnostic services as everyone is aware. And this uh, delays diagnosis and treatment and increases cost of care by up to 2x due to need for patient and or sample transportation. So at Save-A-Mob, we address this gap through an AI-enabled platform that reduces the cost of primary care by up to 50%. It has two components. Second slide, please. The first component is AI-based proprietary point of care screening for blood, vision, urine, diet, and sputum. In blood, we can do your RBC and WBC counts and screen for conditions like anemia. In vision, screen for diabetic retinopathy and cataract. In urine, screen for pus cells, red blood cells, and calcium oxalate crystals. In sputum, screen for tuberculosis. And in diet, we can predict your multivitamin and mineral deficiencies and recommend a complete diet, exercise, and stress reduction plan. Um, all this can be done by a nurse or a health worker with minimal training. This is rapid. This works offline in a low resource setting. And the list of conditions you're seeing here is just a starting point. Uh, just on blood alone over time, we can add support for more than 50 different medical conditions. And we have also added a developer API through which any third party developer can add um, and can use our AI algorithms just through a simple REST API call in their, uh, in their applications. Next slide, please. 
The second component in our platform is health outcome delivery via telehealth and asset light pop-up clinics. In telehealth, we support embedded video consultations on web and mobile and second opinions. And in asset light pop-up clinics, we can set these up anywhere in 15 minutes or less and uh, offer a range of uh, protocols in the context of these uh, pop-up clinics using our technology and off-the-shelf equipment and telehealth. These protocols range from general health to vision, dental, nutrition, cardiometabolic, infectious disease, cancer, ENT, and more. Next slide, please. Our business model is B2B. Our customers are employers, health insurance, pharmaceuticals, NGOs, uh, local government agencies, hospitals, and clinics. Uh, we charge for our software on a standard SaaS model, and then we charge for health outcome delivery on a dollar per day or a dollar per unit per month model. Some of our customers include pharmaceuticals like Novartis and Alchem, uh, large employers like Indian Oil, Bharat Petroleum, and Hindustan Petroleum, uh, health insurance companies like Aditya Billa Health and Magma Health, um, NGOs like SOS Children's Village and Swasti, and hospitals like Apex. We currently have more than 99 such B2B customers. Our renewal rate has been 95% plus over the last several years, and our gross margins are currently 16%. Next slide, please. So our impact includes up to 25,000 patient consults per month, up to 50% reduction in cost of primary care. Uh, we did a study with Medtronic in three states of India uh, where our diet AI was used by a nurse and a full nutrition intervention was done using that. Uh, so the cost of uh, uh, delivering that nutrition intervention was uh, actually 67% lower uh, when a nurse with our diet AI was used versus using our dietitian. Um, same way um, in malnutrition, we have uh, reduced up to 15% malnutrition in select groups. Again, in the same study uh, in the target adult population, when our uh, diet AI was paired with behavioral counseling and supplements, um, it reduced uh, malnutrition in 13% of the adult population, up to 25% reduction in vision issues, and then early detection and treatment of life-threatening diseases like COVID-19, uh, tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, since last year, we have done more than 25 different contracts for COVID, uh, which include the whole range of COVID services from, um, on, uh, from consultations to on-site testing um, to actual treatments for mild symptomat asymptomatic and moderate like no patients and then referrals uh, for more uh, critical uh, patients. Next slide, please. We currently serve 15 plus states of India and we've also done pilots in the uh, one state of the US and uh, in Southern Africa. And while we do serve tier one and tier two, where we really differentiate is in tier three and rural, where we have currently one of the largest coverages um, in, um, in India. Next slide, please. So with that, I will uh, wrap up this uh, three minute spotlight. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at uh, uh, my email or phone number. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and, and you'll stick around for the panel, I'm sure, and uh, I really appreciate you kind of sharing your model of reducing the cost of, of primary care and, and increasing and improving outcomes. It's exciting, and I've been reading a lot about Sevamov, and I'm excited to hear more. Um, we're going to now transfer over to Lila, Lila Cookshank from uh, One Family Health. She, she is the Chief Operating Officer. Good morning, good afternoon, Lila. I'm excited to hear what you have to share, and then we'll get right into the panel. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good morning for me and, and good afternoon to, to those in other time zones. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak this morning about One Family Health. There has been a lot of discussion today about meeting patients where they are and digital solutions and you know thinking about improved future solutions to, to do that. But um, I think it also requires a certain level of physical infrastructure to ensure that patients have access to the testing and treatment that's needed. And, you know, I think that's where One Family Health is really focused. Rwanda is known as the land of a thousand hills. If you can go to the next slide. Um, about 83% of the population live in rural areas where the mountainous terrain really compounds uh, physical distance as an access, as a barrier to accessing care. And while Rwanda has made significant progress in the health system, health sector, in fact, is a global SDG leader in this domain there remains a long way to go to achieve universal access to, to healthcare and rural communities are really most in need. In many rural areas, Rwandans still walk access, hours to access care and the impact is clear. Uh, health seeking 
uh, indicators of health seeking behavior as well as health outcomes in rural communities still lag behind their urban counterparts and access is, is identified as a barrier to um, distance as, as a barrier to accessing care. Next slide. One Family Health has worked in Rwanda since 2012 to help address this rural healthcare gap uh, using a franchise model. So we recruit qualified nurses and empower them to own and operate health posts in rural areas. And this entrepreneurial opportunity for the nurses helps address a key challenge, which is attracting health professionals to stay and work in rural areas. As franchisor, we provide a lot of support to the nurses to enable them to make this leap to become entrepreneurs. Um, we provide access to financing at preferable terms based on de-risking the investment, training in clinical and operational management, drug distribution, and other ongoing support and monitoring to ensure adherence to high quality standards. Um, underpinning all of this is, an, is a mobile health system that we use that facilitates the clinic management um, in the hands of the nurses, as well as the monitoring oversight and logistical planning um, for One Family Health's franchise office. In turn, the nurses provide um, health promotion, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment in rural areas. Um, thanks. Next slide, please. And what truly distinguishes our model, you know, from other franchise clinic chains, we are certainly not the only one, um, you know, experimenting with this business model. Um, but what really differentiates us is our public-private partnership with the government of Rwanda. And it enables, you know, this model to be financially sustainable. The local government provides rent-free facilities for the health posts, so we are not building new facilities. Um, although there is often some, some renovation and, and maintenance required. Um, our clinics are part of the national health system. They're co-branded by the Ministry of Health and this streamlines the referral process, provides access to ambulance services when needed um, and you know, provides a, um, a stamp of approval of quality uh, for, for patients accessing care. And finally, critically, um, our clinics participate in the National Health Insurance Program, which in Rwanda has very broad coverage. 80 to 90% of the population is insured. Um, and this, of course, is critical in, in making services affordable to the most vulnerable um, who pay. In fact, the insurance program is, is on a sliding scale. And so their, their fees and their co-payments are, are much reduced. But it provides a steady revenue stream for franchisees to run a business. And next slide. Just a little bit about where we are and what we've achieved. Um, One Family Health has reached nearly 2 million Rwandans. And by the end of this year, we'll have 150 uh, health posts under management. And I, I should have said health posts are the, the lowest level facility in the, in the Rwandan health system. Our impact can also be measured in terms of job creation and cost savings to the government. Uh, but I wanted to comment today a little bit on uh, something we've seen in terms of crowding in investment from other partners and donors, as well as from the government itself. Um, we're, we're beginning uh, to pivot at, as, as we, I think we've, we've helped to shape the trajectory of primary care in Rwanda, um, as we've been able to to prove to the government and to customers that um, you know, a private company can effectively manage health posts in Rwanda as part of the national system. Um, the government is, is sort of opening their eyes to the way that this can play a role in expanding access to primary care and, and private management is actually now the exclusive focus of the national plan for health posts, um, which is currently being finalized. And so one result of this is for us, a shift away from financing the clinic renovation and startup costs. As I mentioned, one thing we've done is offer low cost loan to franchisees. Um, but in fact, as additional donors and partners are directing more, more dollars um, from the national budget, as well as you know, private sources into the establishment of clinics, um, One Family Health is going to be able to move a little bit away from the opening of clinics to the management of clinics that have been established by others, enables us to refocus on our core business of management and drug distribution. Um, and to that end, we're also looking at um, providing drug distribution services to, you know, to additional clinics within the facilities, I should say, within the national system. So I think this is an example of how, um, you know, the government is 
uh, has sort of started with just putting its toe in the water and after seeing some evidence of the potential for this collaboration, um, you know, we're beginning to explore continuing to change roles. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pause there. I think I'm about at time. Thank you, Lila. Uh, uh, and I we really appreciate you sharing the One Family Health mission. And, you know, it's uh, fascinating to see um, you know, Rwanda, this geographically small country in the, in, the, in the middle of Africa doing amazing things. And what, what it really means to me is the future means different things to different areas of the, of the world. And just the work that you're Absolutely. doing at One Family Health is just tremendous. So um, we're going we're gonna to kind of be joined now with uh, another group of, of providers that, uh, across the country and globe. Um, and I, I thank you, Shelley, as well, for sharing your uh, Seven Mob presentation. And we have three other uh, folks that are joining. We have Dr. Rich Loomis, who serves as the Chief Medical Information Officer for the Clinical Solutions Group at Elsevier. We have Dr. Molly Coy, who has many positions. We'll be referencing her work as the executive in reference at Avia. And Dr. Dev Sang Sangvai, um, he is the Vice President of Population Health Management at Duke University. So welcome to the rest of that group. We're so excited to have you. We have about you know, 45 minutes to just to chat away around the future of primary care. So what I'll do similar to Patricia is I'll ask a question. And, and with that first question, maybe perhaps you can introduce yourself, what you're doing in your specific world. And um, I'd like to start with Dr. Molly Coy. Um, from your perspective, um, how will the delivery of primary care and the big million dollar question evolve over the coming years? And what specifically do you think we need to do to kind of ensure that we meet the needs of, of your patients? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think you've provided bios to people, but very briefly, I work with Avia, which is a US based company that helps help insurers but principally delivery systems, which for us are hospitals and, and doctor groups, understand what digital can do for them, make strategic plans, roadmaps for the next two to five to 10 years, make real-time decisions for investments in new technologies, and then we support the adoption, the implementation, and after the deployment, the evaluation of how this is working for them. And it's a network of members who share their own experience with each other. And so for the last 30 years, I've been involved in tracking and supporting adoption of appropriate digital technologies in healthcare. Um, the work with Avia summarizes a lot of the knowledge in the US about digital technologies for the delivery of healthcare, but I've been interested for decades and worked also in global health. Many of you probably know PATH, the, one of the, it's actually the largest global innovation group in healthcare, but they span everything from vaccines to digital. Um, and I think from a global point of view, what I'd like to return to later on when we, I think I had some slides, Ryan, I know most people aren't using them, but I just wanted to bring up a couple. We are ready for you. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, what I wanted to talk about is digital in the context of universal health coverage, because even though Avia in my current work with that um, in the United States provides one set of background and a viewpoint, the much more important viewpoint globally, I think, is the importance of primary care for universal health coverage. And the brutal fact that our current trajectory won't reach universal health coverage by 2030, and that we are going to need digital in order to facilitate the necessary change and achieve our goals. And with that viewpoint, you can look at the utility and importance of investment in digital, but you also have to, I believe, um, and we believe at PATH, understand the extent to which each country and every community has different ways of approaching that and that the global goods available that are appropriate for every situation are not only globally developed and globally sourced, but actually we are learning hand over fist in the United States as the acceleration of innovation in other countries has moved forward. Can I have the next slide? 
Thank you. So I just wanted to introduce Digital Square, which is about six years old now. Some of you may have run into them or had experience with them because this is a joint funded program that USAID and the Gates Foundation and then a number of international donors as well have supported this. And if you think about what Gavi has done for vaccine development and distribution around the world, PATH was the nonprofit organization that initially developed Gavi, brought to get convened all the partners for Gavi. And Digital Square is a, is a very similar effort in digital for global purposes. And so what they do is work with the innovators globally to advance the adoption and replication of tools with governments and technology experts in specific countries to strengthen local capacity and then to find more donors to support the adoption of technologies in specific countries. And you can see in the lower left, I, I believe, Ryan, that they're, you're going to distribute or make this available to people afterwards. Absolutely. So don't worry about taking notes on all of this. Next slide. Great. And the two of the three goals here are tremendously important in terms of primary care and universal coverage. One is to have a global consortium like Abi that is able to provide some level of vetting and financial support and investment and the infrastructure work, as you'll see on the right in the health system capacity. And Digital Square has been working with many countries. If we go to the next, I think it's the last slide. So a huge number of countries around the world through their ministries of health and through specific organizations that are delivering healthcare in those countries or are developing the digital solutions are working on understanding the challenges and there's 40, 50 years of background of work in this in you know, all over the world understanding the challenges and making sure that the, the globally developed innovations are brought to the attention of other countries. So we just heard, for example, about a spread from India to not only Georgia and the United States, but also to Africa. And it's to facilitate that kind of flow and support in country as well as between country the development and adoption and the government um, work, because there's so much work in developing workforce, in regulations, in working with ministries of finance on appropriate investments. And I think what we heard from Lila underscores how successful work within a country that deeply understands their needs can be. But, um, I just wanted to introduce this to people because it has been so far a fairly successful collaborative and it's very exciting to see this kind of thing develop and you may want to go and look at it. It's a nonprofit and um, shares all their information globally. So let me stop with that. I think that is really important for the three to five year, 10 year goal of universal health coverage is to make primary care available to all, and digital is the absolutely essential component. Thank you for sharing. That was wonderful, Molly, and I think it's a great transition as we you know, heard Dr. Parsa mention that 50% of the world does not have access to primary care. And you talk a little bit about the need for digital in the future to kind of leapfrog us into, the, into tomorrow. I'm gonna ask Dr. Rich Loomis just to kind of give his own perspective on how he thinks delivery of primary care will evolve. And you know, with that, with that, Rich, maybe you just share a little bit about your role at Elsevier as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Ryan. Appreciate the invitation to join this morning. Um, as Ryan mentioned, I am a chief informatics officer for our healthcare business at Elsevier. Um, I also lead um, our drug information businesses, providing drug information solutions to um, both healthcare delivery systems as well as um, other uh, um, uh, 
entities within the healthcare system, retail pharmacies and so forth. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Elsevier as a publisher of uh, evidence-based content. And, and certainly um, we, we do that uh, today across the globe, um, reaching more than, than 100 different countries. Uh, at the same time, we're also transforming to leverage technology to deliver our content in new and innovative ways uh, that will impact care uh, decision making in the clinical workflow. And this is true for all healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and other allied healthcare care professionals. And as, as I'll share in, in just a moment, um, some examples of, of where we're actually enabling um, frontline uh, social workers with, with tools to help them start to deliver uh, care and enable them to deliver care that historically um, they have not, not delivered. Getting back to, to Ryan's question around um, how primary care will evolve. I'd like to build on Dr. Coy's point around technology. So uh, we are very much leveraging technology and we see at Elsevier, we see technology as really an enabler to help reduce uh, the, the healthcare delivery disparities uh, across the globe, uh, essentially as an equalizing force um, to, to improve uh, and, and raise the bar for healthcare deliver globally. Um, some, some examples of this are in clinical decision support and building in leveraging uh, existing content, but transforming it in a way that will enable um, providers at, at lower levels to deliver the same level of care as, um, as, as historically uh, physicians have provided. And in many regions across the globe, such as India, for example, um, care has historically been sought in hospitals and city centers. Um, and so increasingly um, being able to, to push and distribute care to primary care settings that are in, in more rural areas has uh, a tremendous benefit for access to patients. Um, one of the projects we're working on in India is around maternal and antenatal uh, care for, for pregnant women and, and specifically providing um, frontline uh, uh, healthcare advocates, otherwise known as ASHAs or, or um, accredited social and healthcare activists with, um, with a mobile-based pathway tool that will help them in providing actual care to, to patients. And most importantly, knowing when to uh, triage and, and refer a patient to perhaps a higher level of care um, that would be important uh, during a, a pregnancy, perhaps if there's a complication or if, if other types of care are needed. So that's just one example uh, from a, a global standpoint of how we're actually today and, and then in the future working towards uh, leveraging technology to ensure that um, the, the latest in evidence-based care is being delivered um, not only by physicians, but healthcare providers at all levels. Thanks, Rich. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate also your, your kind of repeating this idea of going from clinic to community and also this idea of because primary care is the, is the, is the entry point for patients across the globe, getting them to the right care model immediately is the right way to go. And it may not be a physician or a provider, maybe a community health worker, um, but arming them with the right digital tools to make the right decisions at the right time is, is the quest that we all have. I love it. Um, and certainly last but not least, Dr. Sangvai from, from Duke, the Vice President of Population Health, maybe just a quick introduction and, and helpful, help us close out this question on how you believe the delivery of primary care will evolve in the coming years and what specifically you think um, we need to ensure, uh, make sure we, we get done for the needs of all of our patients. Good morning. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Um, it's my first Zoom conference, right? Um, uh, good morning, Ryan. Uh, thank you to you and the entire innovations and healthcare team. This has been a great dialogue. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a part of the Duke University Health System and we're an academic medical center in southeastern United States. Uh, and our focus uh, as it comes to primary care has really been trying to understand what primary care will look like in the future. So from a population health perspective, it really takes into consideration the type of contracts we enter into with payers, what type of obligations we have to deliver on quality, to deliver on cost, 
and then thinking about how you redesign the healthcare system to be able to sustain that type of model. I think the conversation we've had today has been great because it's really highlighted the importance of primary care, both here in the United States and globally. And as a primary care physician, it's really validating. I think the challenge we're gonna face, particularly here in the US is how we don't overburden a system that in many ways is very fragile. Uh, we know access is challenged here in the US, even in areas where we have the high density of primary care providers. In some cases, that's the payment model. But even in rural areas, there's also this challenge of accessing primary care. Uh, and then I think we have to look to solutions that don't always put more pressure on the primary care provider to do something. Whether it's technology, whether it's data, whether it's additional resources, if the route to getting everything we want to do in healthcare requires us to do it with the primary care provider, particularly the provider doing the work, we're going to overburden. And so really thinking about how you use a team uh, to really think about uh, distributing care in a way that everybody is uh, a part of a functional team uh, and really um, looking towards those same kind of endpoints and same goals. So some of the things we've looked at is not only giving data in real time to our providers, but actionable data. So when that patient is in front of the provider, they know exactly to do what to do with the data. Uh, and then it really extends to uh, embedding mental health professionals in our primary care settings. Uh, and then from a population health perspective, uh, thinking about how you provide wraparound services in a way that when individuals are not in your hospitals and clinics, that you still are focusing on their healthcare needs. Uh, and then all of this has really been magnified probably in the last year or two, as we think about not only outcomes from a quality perspective, but taking into consideration um, inequities in healthcare, how you uh, overcome disparities uh, and the like. So uh, a lot of things happening simultaneously, but I'll end by saying if the solution is to put more pressure on the primary care provider, and I imagine this is true throughout the world, I don't think we're gonna get where we need to get. We've gotta find a way that uh, deburdens primary care so that it can be as efficient as possible. Thank you so much, Dev. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And I'm going to go back to, you know, Lila gave us an, um, an overview uh, on One Family Health and the idea of a team-based model um, at, in Rwanda. And that also includes policymakers and the government as well. Do you have anything to add based on what you heard from, from the folks here, specifically around teams and, and arming them digitally? I think... Um... Absolutely. Well, one thing you can see in Rwanda is that, um, you know, th there is work to look at the sort of the menu of services, for example, that's provided at the health post and, and what is the role of the nurse that runs the health post. Um, within our model, she has, you know, a, a digital management system. Um, I think we have, we have a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement around clinical support tools. Um, but one thing that you do see is as, although the government is, is, I mean, really to be commended in Rwanda, I think for embracing new ideas and, and, and looking at new innovations, you can still see that there's a lot of need for sort of rationalizing the, um, the care that's delivered at, at different levels to optimize that team. For example, there's a little bit of redundancy around what the community health workers do and what the nurses can do at the health post level part of the reason is that health posts aren't evenly distributed around the country. But nonetheless, there's, there's really a logistical and a management challenge to, to um, I think, support a team to work together that, that's not all in the same place in this case, right? Broadly defining what that team is. Um, so One Family Health can, can provide a lot of the management and sort of take that off the ministry's plate a little bit. But Really, there's more work to be done to help the community health workers, you know, operate at their highest capacity. Um, and then just one other comment, which I, I think is coming up a little bit in the in the chat box, is really thinking about the economic sustainability of it and how do you maximize what you're getting from the community health workers while still having, you know, the nurses there for a more advanced level of treatment when needed. Um, really looking at the long-term management and, and the, the unit economics to figure out what's, what's gonna be sustainable. And that's a huge challenge. Yeah, thank you, Lila, that's great. And um, I'm gonna go over to, to Shelly just really quick because there's a lot of talk around uh, the B2B model that you have and how digital technology in the future can, can kind of help with that. So um, maybe you can um, comment, Shelly, on how Seven Mob does kind of 
accumulate a team and, and what you see as the future for, for your firm as far as the B2B model, you know, in the country, in, in India and anywhere else that you're, you're planning to go? Um, sure, Ryan. So, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, where we see the biggest gaps, uh, especially in tier three and rural, are in um, that point of care diagnostics, as well as um, enabling the, um, the workers there to be more productive and enabling them to do more protocols. So, in, in our B2B model, uh, we uh, target both the providers as well as the payers. On the provider side, we provide them a technology platform, which first of all enables the nurses or health workers to uh, to, uh, to do more protocols at point of care, to do them correctly, and then to be able to diagnose different diseases or at least screen for different diseases, and then facilitate a telehealth consultation uh, with a remote uh, physician. So that, uh, first of all, reduces the cost in the system. Uh, it reduces the time it takes to diagnose and then get to the treatment um, aspect of it. And it makes the nurse or a health worker more productive. Now on the payer side, uh, we offer them a comprehensive um, health outcome delivery model because the payers do not care how, how good your technology is, especially in developing markets. What the payers like say employers or um, government agencies or uh, uh, health insurance companies they care about is, uh, can we reduce, for example, malnutrition by X percent? Can we reduce the occurrence of cardiometabolic diseases by Y percent or not, right? So uh, technology alone is never a solution. Um, and that's why we offer along with technology, a very scalable last mile health outcome delivery which then delivers those health outcomes. Thanks, Shelley. Yeah, and I'm going back to the last panel around kind of the balance of technology and digital support along with this humanistic care model. Um, and it seems like that will be the, the way of the future as well as we continue because, you know, I think if I remember uh, Tarun Kapoor mentioned this idea of bad news, right, and being able to express mm -hmm. that personally in a human way versus through a digital app or through telemedicine, you know, that was really resounding to me. But I'm, I'm going to kind of shift around um, this idea of the future to Molly about capacity. You, you, you mentioned Avia and PATH and, and this grand notion of, of really putting a digital solutions in the arms of all of these different countries and really fascinating to see your presentation what what is what do you think your biggest challenge will be in the future um to to get that grand idea of getting healthcare in the hands of every every citizen of the world right well the, the reason i think that united that universal health coverage is so important is that's a basic financing mechanism for access to primary care in most countries and part of the problem of very inadequate primary care in the United States is due to the fact that it's un underfinanced and not understood as the very important role that it should play. Um, and from that point of view, I think that the, the biggest challenge that we face is not the desire of the workers in the health systems in each country, in the ministries and in the community health workers, when they are introduced to tools that could help their productivity and produce the kind of hybrid models that we've been talking about, but that there's an entire hierarchy of multiple ministries of the government, of regulations, of culture, et cetera, that has to migrate as well. And so that's why a lot of the emphasis in Digital Square and in PATH's work is not just on creating a marketplace for the technologies, but we have training programs for ministry staff in finance and health in various areas. And being able to understand, for example, how will the role of the community health worker evolve? We've heard great examples here about that. But what does that mean for investment in training? A lot of that is financed by the individual models so far. And if that actually turns out to bear up in many, many countries, it's very promising because you don't need huge additional investments in training for the staff to do this kind of thing. So I'm very optimistic about it, but I think the barriers are, you know, the traditional approach of many government mechanisms. And I would certainly list CMS and Medicaid et cetera, within the US as, as one of those and those cultural issues and making sure that it truly fits and is accepted by and, and enthusiastically welcomed by 
the populations that are going to be served. That's great, and, and thank you. I think I think what's fascinating is we have this amazing, diverse, global group of speakers and panelists. Um, and you bring up CMMI and CMS specifically. I think it would be great for us to help them understand of all these great things that are going across the globe um, that have you know really cut the time of from mm -hmm. idea to ex execution. Dr. Dr. Parson mentioned 17 years from becoming a new practice to a best practice. We're seeing the innovators with innovations in healthcare cut that significantly. So I think it's a really good point. And you know, staying on that topic of you know the workload and and putting um, distributing it in the right way. Rich, I'm going to ask you around the makeup of primary care. I think we've all decided or all agree that the future of primary care will uh, need or, or necessitate folks like pharmacists, nurses, and community health workers to be armed with a better set of tools to do their job better. So maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit with what you're seeing in the, out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. And, and linking this back to, to Dr. Quay's comments around training and education, how can we maximally train and educate at every level and, and across every persona or role in, in the care delivery team, um, maximally empowering them to deliver care? And so that's sort of one part of the problem that's on the, the, the delivery side. Um, but then how do we actually get patients to, to access the, the right level of care? How do we actually triage and identify um, where, where patients should be routed into the, the, the system, if you will? And, and part of that, as, as Lila mentioned earlier, is, is um, cultural. Uh, for example, um, patients being uh, accustomed to, to receiving care in a certain way, or, or, and, and so breaking down some of those, those barriers, both around um, access, but also cultural, perhaps geography and so forth. And then layering it on top of that, the, the medical knowledge to know where to triage and, and where to direct patients within the system. Um, so as has been a theme throughout the discussion this morning, what are the opportunities to, to leverage technology and what role does technology in playing a part of enabling that, that triage? I think we're, we're um, working right now with primary care practices in the UK with referral pathways. And, and so how can we help shorten the duration of time to when a patient is um, actually seeing the, the right specialist that they need to be seeing by reducing the administrative overhead, reducing the documentation burden, but also ensuring that ultimately the patient is, um, is, is receiving um, the care from, from the right specialist, from the right the right type of provider and so forth. I think another example um, we're seeing uh, the, the pandemic in, in, in so many ways has, has dramatically accelerated how uh, healthcare is evolving um, in the US and, and even um, in, in countries across the globe, we're seeing um, uh, healthcare professionals that, that historically haven't provided direct patient care like pharmacists who are now um, gathering test samples, who are administering vaccines. And I think we're only going to see that sort of shift accelerate as we realize like uh, th there's no reason why we shouldn't be um, empowering uh, other members of the care team to be delivering care that has traditionally been delivered by other personas. That's great, great, great. Thanks, Rich. And you know, I read an article recently around this idea of unfrozenness in the healthcare world, and we've been frozen in time for for a while. And, and COVID gave us this opportunity, as tragic as it was, to unfreeze. And and how how are we going to stay unfrozen and nimble in this world? And I'm going to turn it over to, to to Deb for a minute about you know you kicked us off around this idea of releasing the burden off primary care physicians and then rebalancing the care in the future and really meaning it right and actually doing it um, would love to hear if you have any stories success stories on the how and models that you've seen where we can continue to replicate that um, across the country and across the globe yeah most definitely you know I think it's a uh... Restating in, in many ways uh, what Molly and, and Richard already mentioned, you know, the economic model here in the United States really makes it difficult to try different things. Uh, the time horizon that uh, that's also been uh, mentioned in the chat also uh, compels individuals to think across the one year income statement. So how do you build an economic model that's not uh, wedded to conventional accounting models uh, and really takes that, that biology into consideration that was mentioned earlier? 
I also think on the training side, there's a, there are scope opportunities. It's not just the number, but who gets to do what. Uh, again, here in the United States, fairly political argument on you know what should be done within the scope of a physician, uh, what can be done by someone who is working side by side with a physician. And I think in many cases, we can probably get capacity and efficiency by picking the right model. Uh, and I think the best example I can give is a success we've had with medication adherence. Uh, we've learned that when you put a pharmacist side by side with a provider uh, to help them really understand everything from medication risks, polypharmacy, and then how to work around adherence, which is really what we're focused on, ensuring individuals who have that diagnosis of hyperlipidemia, for example, are taking their statin and they're taking it every day. And we found that we've been incredibly successful, uh, best in class in many cases, uh, and it's really the, the teamwork that comes from our providers being able to engage with patients, but then the pharmacist being there to really help support not only the patient, but in many cases, the provider as well. Uh, and I think that's just one example. You know, there are other examples we found that if you've got to uh, have a, a visitor in the home that's aligned with your healthcare provider, uh, there are better outcomes you can achieve that way as well, including uh, avoiding uh, visits to the emergency department that may otherwise not need to happen because you have an individual who has been checked in on in the home. And again, all of these really require trying to think about how that whole team works together. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree um, with the idea of sometimes these things contradict each other and we have to figure out a way to, to navigate smartly. Uh, it's very difficult, as, as we all know. Shelly, I'm, I'm going to kind of ask you, there's, there's some talk a little bit um, about the idea of, of employers and how they play a role and how they will play a role in the future. And um, maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on, on um, the right sites that you're rolling out to and how the employer plays a role in that how the, and how they will in the future when it comes to primary care. Um, sure. So, uh... We target a very large number of employers uh, and serve them a, a, a large number of employers, uh, Ryan. And we look for a couple of like you know unique uh, characteristics there. So first, uh, it's much easier to scale uh, the model if the employer has a multi-state or multi like you not know, town, multi-city presence, right? That way, you can uh, showcase the do the pilot at one site and then replicate very quickly in other sites. And the cost of uh, customer acquisition is much lower using this approach, um, as well as uh, the overall team productivity is much like you no know, higher. Um, the second thing is uh, 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 employers which have both employees as a captive like you no know, audience and also have some interest in uh, let's say corporate CSR initiatives for say rural beneficiaries. So then what happens is if you start one intervention, let's say for the employees, then you can, if you show traction, if you show success, in terms of health outcomes with the employees, then you can also target, say, the, the, the corporate CSR departments in the same employers, right? And so you don't have to start a completely new sales cycle and pitch like you know, all over again. It's just like much faster and much easier uh, than to target their CSR and uh, then target, uh, address the needs of the rural beneficiaries. So I would say those are some of the things. And uh, the value should be that, first of all, we come to where you are especially when it comes to employees. They don't want to like travel to somewhere to get say preventive or primary care, right? Uh, if you can somehow show that you will get the care where you are, either via telehealth or via like mobile clinics or whatever it might be, right? Then there is more, uh, there's better engagement like you know, uh, there. Um, the second thing is you have to say that, uh, okay, it's not that we can just serve one site or two site or like, you know, let's say one state. Um, across all your like, you know, sites where you are present, if we can serve you, and then the employer is more uh, uh, is more uh, responsive uh, to your uh, pitch. Um, and then the last thing is you have to show them that uh, we will not only deliver the care, but we will also prove to you via dashboards the health outcomes, right? So if you can via technology uh, prove to them that yes, you reduced uh, so and so medical conditions by X percent, and then the employers because even their sponsors, they they're like you know your, your point of contacts there, they have to show that they spent all this money. Um, uh, like, you know, for employee care or like, you know, CSR, what were the results of that, right? So if you can prove those results via dashboards, and then that like would help in renewables and so on. That's great. Thanks, Shelly. Um, Lila, I wanted to tie together two concepts here that, sh that Shelly just mentioned, kind of proving the, the, the outcome, you know, and also uh, what we've been talking about in the last, you know, 10 or 15 minutes around connecting teams digitally. Um, can, can you maybe share One Family Health? I know you talked about the health posts in, in Rwanda and how that's been really effective. Can maybe you share how that, um, your outcomes and along with getting kind of 
technology in the hands of the right folks and how that will help increase in the future has led to kind of very good success in Rwanda. There we are, thank you. Um, you I, uh, two examples come to mind. I mean, one just so, as I've mentioned, we our primary sort of digital platform is really about clinic management and operations support, um, you know, patient data. And one thing that we've seen is that, you know, nurses, providers have a lot of insights about what's going on in the health of their communities. Um, and we've had two different examples over time where they've noticed, you know, an uptick in something, uh, in one case, diarrheal disease. And we're able to sort of alert health officials um, to the fact that there was actually a, a, a well with some contamination um, and that was able to be addressed, you know, much sooner than, than would have happened otherwise. And I think the, over time, we will really be able to use our, um, you know, as, as we grow and our sort of data science improves, we'll be able to use rem our remote monitoring to, to pick up on that kind of thing as well, you know, to identify variations in, in population health. And um, so that's one thing that comes to mind in terms of the role of the, the digital tools and how we can apply them at the, at the health coast level. I think the reality is that, you know, our system is, is more nimble, at least right now, than, than what the government has. And, and you know, maybe just to point out a, a challenge that talk about the burden on the provider, the current reality is that, um, you know, our, our nurses uh, have to meet the reporting requirements of the Ministry of Health as well. So they, they actually complete duplicate records. So they're filling in manually, um, you know, the, the paper records for the HMIS system, in addition to using the, the digital tool. And we just, we just haven't, been able to get around that because the government has the requirements and they haven't moved to a digital system yet. We're working on them. Hopefully there, there seems to be a little bit of own openness actually to their adopting the system that we use, which was developed by a, a South African firm. Um, but let's see the other, you know, just another example, and it's, it's a little bit se separate really, but um, is going back to the, the team's question. Um, I think another advantage of having, you know, a, a private system in this case, and the the nurses empowered to be their own, you know, business owners, is that they can hire the team that they need to support them. Um, some of these clinics have a pretty low level of patient traffic, and the franchisee sees all of the patients themselves. Um, almost all of them have an administrative system to help with the record keeping, uh, but not all of them. You know, some of them may feel more comfortable or whatever it may be, have the time to do that themselves. And some of them do not. Some of them hire an assistant nurse. Um, some of them, you know, hire, hire other kinds of staff. So I think the, you know, there's something to be said for the flexibility and um, sort of decentralization of some of that decision-making around what, what team is needed, what support is needed for the providers. Um, not sure that entirely answered your question, but I, I've been thinking about that team example. Um, and, you know, one of those advantages of the, the flexibility and then empowering the, the provider on the front lines to really identify their needs um, and then equipping them, of course, with the tools to meet their needs. And I think being part of a network certainly helps with that. They can learn from others and uh, adopt other examples that, that have worked that might work for them. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that example. You absolutely answered the question. I think one of the things that we're seeing, and, and I work with health systems often, and in the U.S. Uh, is this the, the structured hierarchy that exists specifically with nurses and physicians and all of the different provider groups and enabling a culture where they are, you know, psychologically safe to raise problems in a really smart way. Mm -hmm. um, and you just gave a great example where a nurse raised an issue um, of, of, a, of a well. And I think we're moving in that direction in, in, in the healthcare system. And I think we need to uh, put that into the higher gear uh, to use another car reference um, to make sure that we're doing that. Um, we have about five minutes left or less in this group. And I, I just want to ask, maybe we'll do a round robin and I'll ask kind of one final question. All things considered, this, this 50, 55 minutes went really fast, by the way. Thank you, mm -hmm. all of you. Um, 
from a futuristic perspective, maybe I'll ask you this question. Um, I'm put Molly on the spot first. <laughs> what's what's one thing you know you think if, if you had to pick one thing that you feel as though globally from a health equity perspective we need to focus on in the future when it comes to primary care? What would it be? Uh, just maybe a minute or so and, and share with us what you think that we should be focusing on. I think it should be uh, vastly expanding the local community health workers and giving them the digital tools and training and support and backup so that their panel size can be vastly more than we ever imagined with the right digital tools and the kind of other testing tools that Shelley was describing, for example, we can actually deliver primary care, but we need the hybrid model of the trusted people on the ground with the digital tools. Thank you, well said. Um, I'm gonna go Shelly, then Rich on the same question. What's one thing you feel as though we should be looking forward to the future and focusing on? You got a bravo, I, Molly, by the way. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with Molly. She pretty much like, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> it is there. But uh, yeah, it has to be a hybrid model. Uh, we have to empower uh, the health workers and nurses at the local level uh, so that using the digital tools, they can deliver more value. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would say that uh, oftentimes when uh, such digital tools are provided to say nurses or nurse practitioners, uh, the physicians, um, in, um, they feel like threatened. That is if their value is reducing. And uh, I would say that their value is not reducing actually. We are enabling them to like serve more patients and uh, like no much faster than they would otherwise do. Uh, like I think one of the previous speakers said, instead of having to like say see 30 patients in a day, wouldn't they like to see say eight or 10 patients in a day and spend like, you know, say instead of 15 minutes, 30 minutes like you no know, per patient. <clears throat> I think they want to do that also. Um, so that's the approach which we should use. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Shelly. Uh, Rich, and then we'll go to Dev. Yeah, totally agree with, with Shelly and, and Molly. Um, we'll add that I, I think we need to be flexible about how we define primary care and iterate on, learn and iterate on the definition of what we have historically considered um, primary care. And I think part of this, you know, and, and among the, the many learnings of the pandemic is really the important role that public health plays and, and rethinking primary care to encompass uh, public health in addition to in addition to primary care and and what role um, does does public health play in in actually delivering primary care to um, to to a broad range of patients? Excellent, excellent. Um, we're going to start a poll. We're going to go with Deb, and then we're going to end it with Lila, and then we'll we'll pass it on. What do you think, Deb? Yeah, great. I agree with all. Uh, all the other uh, speakers. The only thing I would add is uh, this uh, focus that we now have on the social behavior drivers of health. We've got to find a way that it doesn't become this add-on, but that we actually deliver care in the context of those. And so uh, building whatever tools, whether they're digital or uh, human capital tools to be able to be able to do that is really going to help us redefine primary care. I love it. I think the idea of embedding these things versus adding these things should be the thesis of, of anything in the future. And I, I love that add on. Thanks. And Lilo, we'll close with you. What is what is one thing you'd like to mention? I think, again, to sort of support and complement, you know, the, the comments everyone else has made, um, I'm thinking about ensuring that the, the financing and that the sort of long term sustainability is clear. Um, maybe not at the very beginning, but but soon that you get those pieces in place, thinking about the context we work in. Um, that long-term picture is not always clear, but to enable adoption of an innovation to support and to become really embedded, there are long-term supports that need to be in place to make that possible. Uh, Lila, good. And, and I, I didn't wanna um, pass over what Dev mentioned earlier about kind of the short-term financial incentive uh, or, or kind of expectations that, firms, business, health systems have, um, there's a great study done that talked about kind of the three pillars of innovation and continuous improvement. And one of them was to not to acknowledge those short-term incentives, but also have a pathway for long-term innovation in primary care. Um, so anyway, loved everything. You guys didn't rehearse that and you did an amazing job answering it. And I'm really appreciative of you taking some time with us on this panel around the future of primary care. I'm gonna hand it back off to my friend, Patricia, to kind of close out this forum. So thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks. Um, yeah, thanks to all panelists.
Um, this has been such a rich discussion and thank you for your insights and your wisdom. And so on behalf of uh, Innovations in Healthcare, I just want to just take a moment to thank everyone who has been part of uh, our event today. Um, special thanks to our keynote speakers, Dr. Shannon Phillips and Dr. Ali Pasa. Um, you know, just really some insightful and, um, you know, words of wisdom that we'll be thinking about as we consider what primary healthcare looks like today and what is really the transformative, uh, what are the areas for transformation that we should be thinking about in the future. And then um, I think also want to just thank our panelists, um, both of our panels, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, the work that you do and sharing with us, you know, how primary healthcare models are changing today. Um, and you know how uh, we're using aspects such as um, you know a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic to draw lessons from, um, as well as also trying to create um, innovations that allow our primary healthcare uh, systems to be nimble and agile to make sure that they are sustainable and continue to be economically viable and empower healthcare providers to meet patients just where they are and provide um, integrated quality and affordable care. Special shout out to the um, Innovation in Healthcare um, Network Innovators who um, you know, provided spotlights and were able to share um, into some depth the work that they're doing across the globe. And then finally, also want to thank our partner Vynamic. Um, thank you for the support um, and the continued relationship and just the resources that you've brought to this uh, event. So as uh, Ryan had mentioned, we do have um, a poll going on. So before you drop off, please, please do share with us your, your uh, perspectives on um, today's events and um, which will help sh uh, shape our future events. As Krishna mentioned at the top of, uh, at the beginning of the event, our next, um, our next uh, event in this series is on August 18th from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern. And um, we really look forward to having all of you. And so final, final thanks to everyone who's made time today to join, with, to join us, to engage so passionately. The chat has been amazing. Um, so much wisdom being shared. And even though we may not have been able to answer all of the questions in the panel, um, please feel free to reach out to the different people that share their contact details and continue this conversation. And so it's just been really incredible to see the passion and um, that everyone has around improving primary healthcare and really thinking about you know what the future of primary healthcare will look like. So with that, thank you everyone and wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead. Bye.